we're going to be public now. Good morning, Joanna. Hello. Good morning to all. Oh, sorry. Good morning. Now I can be visible. Good morning. Good morning, good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> good. Very good. Um, well, um, uh, right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, here we are at day two of our seminar on the Greater Magata question. And um, our first speaker is Philipp Maas, who is a Wissenschaftlicher Mitarbeiter at the University of Leipzig, and who has, uh, as many of us already know, has got a distinguished history as uh, somebody who has rewritten the early story of yoga and uh, the history of yoga and has made major contributions in several Shastric fields. And it's my pleasure today to invite uh, Philip to share with us his thoughts on how the Mahabharata can help us to think analytically about the Greater Magadha problem. So testing the Greater Magadha hypothesis on the Mahabharata. Two narratives from the Tirtha Yatra Parvan. Thank you, Philip. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dominic, for this um, very kind uh, introduction uh, of uh, my talk. Yes, we are turning now to uh, narrative uh, literature uh, in order to see what um, the greater Magadha hypothesis can uh, achieve by using it as a, as a background for interpreting uh, some uh, narratives, specifically two narratives on the Tirtha Yatra part. And in order uh, to do so, I have uh, structured my presentation into uh, three parts. I will uh, first uh, of all talk about uh, yeah, narratives in the Mahabharata as test cases for the Greater Magadha hypothesis. And in order to do so, of course, we have to uh, address uh, the question of uh, dating of the Mahabharata, whether the material that we are looking at actually uh, fits the hypothesis uh, that uh, shall provide uh, the background uh, for the analysis. And then I'm uh, briefly addressing the question of whether it's at all possible to use narratives as historical sources, and if this uh, should be uh, possible, uh, how this uh, can be done. And uh, in the second main part, I then uh, will turn to two narratives from the Tirtayatra Pavan and the creation of Neo-Brahmanism. I will uh, interpret uh, the Jantu Pakyana, uh, which in my view, uh, and according to my analysis, um, established uh, with narrative means a hierarchy of religious causalities, which uh, includes the integration of uh, karma theories, which are so uh, relevant for the greater Magadha hypothesis. And then a second narrative, um, uh, in which, which uh, in my view, has to do with kingship, ritual power, and the devaluation of Buddhist conceptions. And the uh, narrative, uh, which uh, we'll take a look at then, will be the Mandatru Pakyana. And finally, I will uh, draw a brief uh, conclusion of my uh, previous analysis. So when we come to uh, the dating of the Mahabharata, we are uh, um, seeing a, a vexed and uh, vexed problem. Um, about uh, which uh, a lot has been written and several um, propositions have been made. So the standard uh, theory would be that the Mahabharata was composed over a long period of time, um, starting from 400 uh, before the Common Era up to approximately 400, um, 400 before the Common Era until 400 of the Common Era, so approximately 800 uh, years. And then Alfilterbeitel has proposed a much uh, shorter um, dating for the Mahabharata. He suggests that the Mahabharata would have been composed from around the year 150 before the Common Era till the beginning of the Common Era in an approximately um, you know, shorter period of time. So a, a new approach to um, this uh, question has been taken by uh, Oliver Helwig in an article published in 2019 entitled Dating Sanskrit Text Using Linguistic Features and Neural Networks. And uh, Oliver Havik there proposes uh, a method, uh, computational methods based on natural language uh, processing. And I have to frankly admit that I, in fact, don't understand all the statistics and the mathematics that are behind this paper. But uh, very conveniently, he comes up with the graphics um, that we see here, figure six, uh, which uh, shows the results of the uh, calculations 
that uh, he has uh, made. He has trained the computer program um, um, to determine um, the, the date of composition with the um, help of materials that do not comprise the Mahabharata. And then after he had uh, received uh, um, satisfactory results, he used uh, this uh, calculus, this algorithm, and applied it to the Mahabharata. And uh, in this way, he came, uh, uh, comes up here with this uh, timeline for the composition of the Bhishma Parvan. We see here an introductory part, uh, the dialogue between uh, uh, Sanjaya and the Dhritarashtra, then the Bhagavad Gita itself, and then uh, the battle uh, um, part of the uh, Bhishma Parvan. And what we can see is that uh, at uh, the beginning, uh, the dialogue, introductory dialogue, and with regard to the Bhagavad Gita, we have a dating that goes uh, quite uh, far up. So these are uh, clearly quite young parts, uh, even uh, reaching beyond uh, the, um, um, the uh, earliest, uh, the, the latest date uh, that was um, proposed in the conventional dating of the Mahabharata, going beyond the year uh, 500. And then we have here um, this uh, battle period uh, uh, starting at maybe 300 before the Common Era and going up to 200 of the Common Era. So that, that would be maybe more um, um, in agreement with uh, the uh, proposal of Hiltebeiter and uh, the introductory parts would be uh, more in agreement uh, yeah, with uh, the um, longer period for co of composition of the Mahabharata. Uh, this is, of course, uh, the Bhishma Pavan. It is not the Tirtha Yatra Pavan. It is just um, uh, yeah, a new, new approach, and it uh, only produces results for part of the Mahabharata. So much more research has to be done. But what we can see with regard to what I'm going to talk about is that we are roughly in the period um, that is relevant for uh, the creation of uh, neo brahmanism uh, according to the greater Magadha hypothesis. So then I address uh, the question of whether narratives can be used as historical sources. It's clear that the narratives do not uh, relate events that have taken place at one time in history. But uh, I think it's uh, quite obvious that narratives uh, have been uh, composed with a certain authorial intention and that it's possible to interpret narrative materials and to get a clue of what the authors want to tell us by uh, combining and relating uh, the narrative to the, um, to the uh, cultural uh, history and to the cultural environment in which they were uh, created. And a very nice formulation of this with regards to the Mahabharata, we find already in the uh, work of Monika Shi, Tapas and Tapas, und Tapas Win in den Erzählenden Partien des Mahabharata. She um, talks about uh, narrative passages um, dealing with uh, asceticism uh, in the Mahabharata, and she says that every narrative is silently committed to a certain intention, which is the reason for its being told. The narrative parts of the epic are, in a certain sense, definitely didactic, because they serve in an open or hidden fashion the purpose of instruction. In this way, every ascetic narrative contains a punchline moral that it propagates. So, um, Along these lines, uh, quite uh, a huge amount of research has been uh, con conducted uh, in spite of the uh, protests that uh, might come from uh, postmodernist studies uh, who have proclaimed the death of the author, in intertextuality theories that claim that uh, relationship between narratives are only created in the mind of the audience and that the author does not play any role and that we should not take authorial intention uh, into consideration. Uh, and um, with regard to this, I can refer to the work of uh, James uh, Hegarty, um, published in 2012, Religion, Narrative and Public Imagin Imagination in South Asia, Past and Present and Sanskrit Mahabharata, um, where he talks about uh, the staging of religious debates by narrative means on page seven to uh, 13. And I would also like to um, and take this opportunity to uh, recommend uh, work by Adiv Satayek, Crossing the Lines of Case, Vishwamitra, and the Construction of Brahmin Power in Hindu Mythology, which was published in 2015. 
So uh, now we are turning to the Tirtha Yatra Parvan, uh, which is a passage of the Mahabharata in which uh, four of the Pandava uh, brothers um, take a tour to uh, sacred uh, sites across uh, um, India. So, um, and the question of whether the Tirtha Yatra Parvan, um, yeah, how this may relate as a frame for the narratives that we look to the greater Magatha uh, hypothesis. And I must say that I find there uh, quite um, interesting uh, connections to the uh, greater Magadha hypothesis. So the Tirtha Yatra Pavan of the Mahabharata is uh, our earliest textual evidence for the practice of pilgrimage, as uh, Brockington uh, has written in his uh, book on the epics, except the Lubini inscription of the Maurya king Ashoka. Um, that this is something um, to which uh, Tim Lubin um, took my attention many years ago when we uh, discussed the Jantu Pakyana in the context of a fierce debate with uh, yeah, uh, some um, uh, opponents to Indological studies in general. So uh, Ashoka's uh, reign was committed to the Shamana regions of Greater Magadha, uh, as we know. And then uh, the, the, the aim of this religious pilgrimage is, is in many uh, places ashramas, this is places of residence of eminent figures that Bronkhaus identifies as having a corresponding function in neo-Brahmanism to that of the caves and monasteries that Shramana religions of Greater Madagada had received from royal sponsors. So ashramas are very important power centers for neo-Brahmanism and they may be a continuation uh, of earlier religious practices uh, that we have seen in the culture uh, of Greater Magadha. So the Tirtayada Pavan uh, deals with a new religious practice, pilgrimage to new religious in uh, institutions, ashramas. And both of these have uh, predecessors in the culture of Greater Magadha. And I think that it may be important uh, to keep this uh, in mind when we analyze uh, the narratives. So um, the uh, narratives in the Tirtayatra Pavan are nine in number that occur in um, uh, um, yeah, in the Tirtha Yatra Pavan, and we have references in two tables of contents uh, of these uh, narratives. Um, one table of contents is the one that we find in the critical edition uh, of the Mahabharata. It gives uh, a certain uh, sequence of uh, tales, and uh, this uh, sequence of tales uh, does not correspond to the sequence that we uh, actually uh, find within the Tirtha Yatra Pavan. And uh, this, uh, uh, the actual sequence is found in a, a so-called star passage of the Mahabharata, which the, auth uh, the editors of the Mahabharata uh, thought to be not uh, the original uh, uh, version of this, or the, the earliest reconstructable version of the text. And I think this, uh, these two deviating uh, tables of context, uh, contents, they uh, indicate that there has been a kind of uh, revision of this uh, passage. And this uh, revision uh, concerns um, three of these narratives. First of all, the uh, narrative of Shivi has been uh, transposed from the second position here to uh, the uh, seventh position. And there are two um, stories that uh, have been inserted. Obviously, the one uh, um, about Mandatra that will play um, a role in this presentation and the one of uh, Yavakrita. So we can see uh, that probably also the Tirtha Yatra Pavan has a longer, um, has been composed over a longer period of time. I, I think it's highly unlikely that uh, a revision uh, of the sequence of, um, uh, of, of tales would have happened in a, in a very short period of time. And of course, we do not know how long this period uh, should have been. Um, so I now come to uh, the first narrative, the Jantu Upakyana. So um, I will first of all introduce uh, the, um, the persons who uh, play a role in this uh, narrative and in, at the same time uh, also summarize uh, the, the narratives. So first of all, we are dealing with a protagonist. This is King Somaka, uh, a king that is mentioned in Rigveda and Aitareya Brahmana, but uh, without any, any details. It's, but uh, the name uh, will, of course, have had some prestige and the connection to uh, Vedic Brahmanism already uh, at the time of the composition of the uh, uh, Jantupakyana. So Somaka, uh, he had 100 wives. 
And uh, although he had 100 wives, he uh, did not become father of a son. And uh, of course, uh, the fathering of the son is an important task uh, for many reasons for a king in order to continue his lineage, but also uh, if he should have been an, um, committed to an ancestor uh, cult, he could have uh, cared about his own fate after uh, he would have passed away. After a long time, then uh, he finally gets a son, a son uh, with the name Jantu, which is a telling name meaning a living being. He is a single son. And uh, all the wives they care for, for his son and they, pam they pamper him and the son grows up and he becomes a weakling. And that's very uh, disturbing to uh, King Sumaka. Um, um, at, at one instance, uh, the child is uh, bitten by an ant into his buttocks. His uh, child starts to cry or the wives uh, also start crying and uh, King Sumaka is uh, completely distressed. Uh, cannot uh, um, conduct his uh, government uh, appropriately, has to comfort his wives and is so frustrated that he's uh, asked his priest uh, um, what he can do about uh, the state of having a single son who then is also weak. Would there be a possibility to get 100 sons? And uh, the priest says, yes, there is such a possibility. We can sacrifice uh, uh, your, your son in a, in a sacrifice that is uh, designed in accordance to a Vedic sacrifice. Um, the king agrees to this and uh, Janto is then uh, sacrificed, he's killed. Um, and uh, the, um, the sacrifice is uh, conducted, as it is said, vidina, according to the prescription. His uh, omentum is burned in, uh, in the sacrificial fire. The women, uh, the, the wives, they smell the sacrificial fire or get pregnant and then give birth to 100 uh, sons. So uh, the um, sacrificial ritual has worked out uh, very nicely in, in this world. Short time later, uh, the priest dies and uh, also Somaka uh, dies. And then Somaka um, uh, arrives in, in the uh, next world and there he meets uh, God Dharma. And he sees that his priest is uh, roasted uh, on a terrible hellfire. And uh, Sumaka is very much surprised and I uh, su suggest that the audience of the Mahabharata is also meant to be surprised uh, because of this. Uh, and we are uh, going to take a look at this passage in a, um, some detail here. Now the king saw that the priest was roasted in a terrible hell and asked him, why are you roasted in hell, O Brahman? To him his teacher, while being roasted on a blazing fire, answered, O king, you sacrificed through me. This is the result of that action. Hearing this, the king seer addressed King Dharma. I want to enter here, release my sacrificial priest because this highly virtuous man is being roasted on hell fire on my account. And then Dharma answers, O king, nobody else than the one who acts experience ever the result of the action. And what Dharma, uh, what we can see here is a clash of two different conceptions of religious agency. Apparently, King Somaka is committed to the conception of agency uh, in accordance with the Vedic uh, worldview and uh, the mechanism of sacrifice. So a sacrificer, he orders a sacrifice to be conducted by his priest, but the result of this sacrificial act, that applies to the sacrificer and not to the person who actually performs uh, the action. But Dharma, yeah, he is apparently committed to the theory of karma. He says nobody else than the one who acts experience ever the results uh, of the action. And we have parallels to this uh, formulation of uh, um, the law of karma within the Mahabharata. And it's very, very uh, prominent in Indian philosophy. Uh, one of the axioms, actually, it's impossible that somebody else experiences uh, the result except the one who has committed uh, the the, um, the action. So the um, discussion uh, in the uh, netherworld then uh, continues. So Maka said, I do not desire the worlds of merit without my Veda teacher. Only together with him, O king of Dharma, do I want to live in the world of gods or in hell, because I am the same as he is with regard to this action. O God, whether um, its result is good or bad, it has to be the same for both of us. Dharma said, King, if you wish it to be this way, experience the fruit together with him for the same time. Thereafter, you will gain a good post-mortem phase together with him. 
So um, Somaka apparently here changed his perspective. Yeah, he agrees that uh, karma is relevant, but uh, he, um, uh, according to his view, uh, the verdict that uh, King Dharma had uh, spoken is not okay, it's not correct, it's not just, because he thinks that he uh, has uh, uh, shares responsibility uh, for um, the crime that had been done, um, had been committed when uh, Jantu uh, was killed. And I think that uh, this um, uh, um, is um, a parallel uh, to the conception of complicity that was uh, introduced uh, um, in, in the context of the Apadama, uh, Apasamba Dharma Sutra, where we find the maxim that the instigator, the one who agrees, and the actor partake of actions that have as their fruit a post-mortem fate in heaven or hell. To him who is most involved, the fruit falls in a distinctive way. And Sumaka he had said, yeah, I'm equal to him with regard to this activity. So I think uh, the verdict that uh, Dharma in the end uh, um, um, makes, namely that uh, they should uh, stay together in hell, this can uh, be seen as a verdict with regard to complicity. But it has also something to do with the willingness of Sumaka to, uh, to stay in heaven in order to enforce uh, this uh, new verdict. And uh, this um, willingness um, to stay in hell and to suffer uh, hell fire, um, to bear this, uh, uh, th this terrible heat uh, of hell, this is something that I would uh, interpret as a prototype uh, a way of asceticism. And uh, uh, I think we can uh, find the support for this in the following uh, passage of the, uh, of the narrative. Now, uh, Lomasha is uh, speaking. He is uh, the uh, one who uh, tells the whole uh, story to Yudhishthira. So we are uh, back on a, a higher frame um, of the um, uh, interlaced uh, narratives here. So Lomasha said, the king of Lotus Eyes did it completely in this way. And afterwards, he who loved his teacher gained his own good worlds that he had conquered through his karman together with his brahman. In front of us appears Somaka's meritorious hermitage, the hermitage, Ashrama, a man who stays there patiently for six nights, gains a good post-mortem fate. We shall stay here for six nights, free from fever and exercising self-restraints. O oh, Kurudvaha, be prepared. So um, just like King Somaka had um, achieved a good uh, post-mortem fate, for, uh, by staying voluntarily in hell together with his Brahmin priest, it's possible to gain for oneself a good post-mortem fate by staying at the ashrama uh, of King Somaka. And this is what the, um, um, what the Pandavas are doing here. They will participate for six, year, uh, six uh, days into the ascetic practices that are practiced here in, uh, in this ashrama in order to secure for them a good post-mortem fate. And we see here the introduction of the idea that asceticism can override or overrule the law of karma. So, and this is this hierarchy of uh, uh, religious causalities um, about which I have been uh, talking uh, initially. Namely, we see that um, um, the Vedic sacrifice is effective in this world. It's a very powerful means to um, manipulate the world in, in the way that uh, one desires. But the post-mortem fate of uh, humans is not uh, established by, um, by Vedic rituals, but by the law of karma uh, in, a, in a general way. But, it's, uh, but this is also not the only way in which post-mortem fates are established. There's a third means which can overrule um, karma and this is uh, asceticism. And that may be one of the reasons why the Pandavas actually undertake this tour to the sacred uh, uh, sites and to practice asceticism there, there in order to immunize themselves, so to say, uh, against uh, the law of karma, which would compel them, of course, to adhere to the ideals of the ascetic religions, like, for example, nonviolence, which they cannot do uh, uh, because they have to fulfill uh, their uh, task of establishing their own uh, power. So yeah, uh, th so much for uh, the Jantu Pakyana. I now turn uh, to the Mandatu Pakyana, and uh, this is, uh, I would say, uh, also uh, highly uh, interesting 
uh, narrative, although it just con uh, consists of 43 stanzas. And in order to um, uh, interpret the, the story in the Mahabharata properly, I think one has to look at the um, King Mandata in Buddhist literature. And if we do so and take a look at uh, Edgerton's Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit grammar dictionary, we find uh, the following. Yeah, he, he says Mandata um, and explains uh, where he is uh, and who he is. It says, there seems to be nothing in Buddhist legend uh, suggesting identity with Sanskrit Mandata except the name. So, and then he uh, explains it's the name of an ancient Chakravarti king, uh, sometimes regarded as a previous incarnation of Shakyamuni. So a little bit more information uh, can be gained here from uh, Malala Sekara's Dictionary of Pali Popa Names, who provides a nice summary of uh, um, the different uh, narratives that we find uh, in the Divya Vadana and in the uh, Mandatra uh, Jataka. Uh, this, of course, uh, refers to the Mandatra Jataka in Pali literature. So um, uh, Malasika uh, summarizes the story as uh, follows. A primeval king and ancestors of the Sakyans, he had the seven jewels of a Chakravati and his four supernatural powers. But he grew discontent and at the suggestion of his ministers visited the Deva world. First, he went to the Chato Maharajika world where he ruled, but still unsatisfied, he went to Tavatimsa. There Saka welcomed him and gave him half of his kingdom. As time went on, Mandatra's craving increased. He wished to kill Saka and to gain the whole kingdom. Because of his greed, his power went and he fell from heaven into the, his park. The gardener announced his arrival to the royal family and they provided a resting place for him and there he lay dying. When asked for a message for his people, he wished them to know how even he, in spite of his great pomp and power, had to die. So this is a typical Buddhist narrative with a message that uh, uh, too much of greed uh, needs, uh, leads to four, that uh, human beings should control their, uh, their greed, uh, and that greed is one of the uh, major factors that uh, prevent uh, spiritual uh, liberation. Now, when we look at um, um, Mandata uh, in the uh, Mandato per Canada, there is at first sight, indeed, not uh, much that would connect uh, the story to um, the, the Buddhist uh, uh, version. First, we have uh, King Yuvanashwa. This is the, the father of King Mandata, a member of the Solar Dynasty, highly uh, devoted to uh, Vedic ritualism and liberal in spending sacrificial rewards to Brahmanas. Then we have a Brahmana priest who is called the son of um, Bhrugu and Mandata and the god Indra who appears here. So the, the basic problem of the story is again that the King Yuvanashwa uh, doesn't have uh, a son. Uh, and in order to, to get one, he practices asceticism, gives the, uh, the royal power to his uh, ministers and exercises uh, himself with a, with a wish to um, uh, achieve uh, a son. But also his uh, Brahmana priests, uh, they, they are busy and they prepare uh, with a Vedic uh, wish-fulfilling ritual in Ishti, uh, a magical portion. Cons uh, consisting of uh, uh, yeah, a drink that should impregnate uh, the wife of uh, Yuvanashwa. But uh, yeah, af after the um, um, sages had prepared this portion, they were very tired because obviously that was uh, an exhausting task. And also King Yuvanashwa, he returned to his ashram being very tired from uh, his exhausting asceticism. And he was also very thirsty, so maybe it also exposed himself to, uh, to heat uh, in this regard. Um, and there he sees uh, the portion and drinks the portion. Um, and then, uh, yeah, he, he falls asleep, uh, wakes up. And uh, when this is discovered, this is portion, uh, that he has drunk, drunk the portion, uh, the course of event cannot be uh, changed anymore. Um, that means that uh, King Yuvanashva uh, gets uh, pregnant. Um, and after 100 years, uh, King Mandatra is born for him, and then King Mandatra uh, becomes a ruler over, uh, over the world. So at first sight, there's not uh, much uh, um, that connects this story to Buddhism. But uh, if we look at the story in more detail, the picture changes. So there are just 43 stanzas in the Mandatra Pakyana, and we have a huge amount of references to Buddhist literature and to Buddhist conceptions. And uh, we will spend some time uh, to uh, go through this in some detail. 
So uh, first uh, stanza 15, yeah. when the king, distressed by thirst, drank the cool water, the intelligent man entered Nirvana and then became very happy. So uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, quite extraordinary because I think this is an uh, ironical uh, a devaluation of the Buddhist aim of salvation of uh, Nirvana. We just have 22 occurrences in the whole of the Mahabharata of the world uh, Nirvana, and it always refers uh, to a higher spiritual aim like Brahma Nirvana in the Bhagavad Gita. Ne? Five of these occurrences uh, are, by the way, in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, which, which uh, uh, may indicate that also the Mandatu Pakyana is a quite late uh, layer of the Mahabharata, but th this is a side uh, a topic here. So he entered Nirvana and then uh, he became, uh, uh, became very happy. So it's uh, first of all the mentioning of the aim of salvation, of uh, the soteriological aim of Buddhism, Nirvana, in, in a, a devaluating way, namely as just uh, becoming very tired and sleeping very happily. And if we uh, take into consideration that Nirvana is uh, claimed to be the highest form of happiness in Buddhist texts, I think that is quite clear uh, illusion. So uh, then uh, stanza 20, a son with great power and manliness who possesses the power of asceticism, um, who with his manliness will even send Indra to the abode of Yama, is mentioned in uh, tw uh, um, stanza 20. And as we have seen uh, uh, previously in the Mandata Jataka, uh, Mandata uh, uh, wanted to kill Brahma, uh, wanted to kill um, Indra. Yeah? And uh, now here we see that uh, Mandata will even send uh, Indra to the abode uh, of Yama. So I think this is uh, another clear allusion uh, to the Mandata uh, Jataka. Then uh, in uh, census uh, 25 to 26, then, when a hundred years were full, the left, left side of this noble-minded king split open, and the son, equal to a second son, came forth, full of great energy, and King Yuvanashwa stayed alive. This seems to be, seemed to be a miracle. This, in my view, is a clear allusion to the birth uh, of the Buddha, as we find it in uh, uh, legendary accounts, for example, in the Buddha Charita. The Buddha is born in a miraculous way from the left side of the queen who survives this uh, event. And we have references to uh, extraordinary appearance of light. So uh, also the mentioning of uh, Mandatra as appearing uh, as a second son uh, is a clear, uh, a clear uh, parallel in my way. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, um, the, the list continues. The wheel of this great-minded king proceeded unobstructed, and all jewels became available to this king seers by themselves. I think that's clearly, clearly an allusion to the ideal of Chakravati. Now we had seen that Mandatra is a Chakravati, and that he possesses the seven jewels. Now these are the seven insignia for a, for a Chakravati in the Buddhist context. But here in this uh, adaptation from the Brahmanical side all jewels became uh, available to the king. And this is seen, uh, um, um, uh, these are of course just jewels in a material, in a material way. So I think that uh, also is an adaptation of the idea of a Chakravati possessing uh, the seven uh, jewels. And then finally, um, we have a uh, center 35, O king, he who piled up chaityas and who possessed great energy, obtained the best dharma and gained with his immeasurable splendor half of Indra's throne. Uh, so there are three uh, references in one stanza. First of all, the appearance of the word Chaitya, which is uh, a word that is used frequently in, in uh, Buddhist context uh, to um, refer to uh, stone uh, buildings with a ritual uh, purpose. Um, then of course we have the uh, usage of the word Dharma, uh, which uh, is of course uh, here probably used uh, in an uh, ambiguous way. It may ref it probably it refers to the new Dharma, the Dharma of Neo Brahmanism, but uh, it still occurs in a in a context uh, full of uh, Buddhist uh, illusions. And then of course uh, he uh, gains with his immeasurable splendor half of Indra's throne. This is exactly what we find in the uh, Mandata Jataka. Indra offers uh, to uh, um, Mandata half of his throne. So I, I, don't, I think that these uh, references are uh, quite uh, convincing. Um, there are also many allusions uh, um, and references um, 
uh, to neo-Brahmanism and uh, the uh, neo-Brahmanical ideal of sovereignty. And we uh, will address this uh, briefly. First, the description of uh, Yuvanashva. There was a King Yuvanashva born in the dynasty of Ikshvaku. I already had mentioned this. This king performed sacrificial rituals that were rich in sacrificial reward. Of course, sacrificial reward presented to Brahmanas. The best among uh, those uh, who support the Dharma performed 1,000 horse sacrifices and very, uh, various other important sacrificial rituals in which rewards were earned. So the same um, things, uh, um, Mandatra is born in a lineage uh, that is completely devoted to uh, Vedic uh, um, um, Brahmanism. Then the description of Mandatra himself. When this child has tasted the forefinger that Indra had given him, he grew oaking to the size of 13 cubits. That means he was approximately uh, three meters uh, high. Um, that's the results of the, of the portion um, and of course of uh, him having been uh, raised and uh, by uh, the forefinger of Indra. Then the Vedas, including the Veda of weaponry and divine missiles became completely available to this Lord when you just thought of him. So he was deeply uh, committed also to Vedic learning in general, but also with the Upaveda like the, the Danur Veda and uh, divine missiles uh, were um, uh, uh, available to him. He was anointed by Indra Magavan himself or Bharata and subdued the three worlds according to Dharma as Vishnu had done with his uh, steps. So subduing the three worlds completely, this is ide the ideal uh, that is propagated here, not uh, the uh, control of craving or... Uh, so for, from, this, from this perspective, the old mandatra of the uh, um, uh, Buddhist um, literature may have uh, appeared as somebody who failed in his uh, project of uh, subduing uh, the whole world. And then um, we uh, continue here, um, overlooked of the world, the world full of riches became his property um, and he performed many different sacrificial rituals with, which, in which well-deserved sacrificial rewards were provided. Uh, nothing special about this, we, we already had this. And then, O king, this great-minded king conquered the four kinds of subjects and with his own ascetic power and energy stabilized the world. So we also have a, a reference here uh, to the uh, introduction and maintenance of a certain social order, I would say. I would say that the four kinds of set, uh, subjects uh, refers probably to the four uh, varnas, um, and uh, he stabilized uh, the world. And that's, that's his uh, task, to stabilize uh, the order that has been established. And then finally, this is the place where he, who was radiant like the sun, performed sacrifices to the gods. Behold it in this very sacred spot in the middle of Kurukshetra. So the, the whole uh, setting um, of the story and the ashrama of uh, Mandatra is positioned in the middle of, uh, of Kurukshetra uh, in, in Aryavarta. So, um, yeah, I think reference to the new Brahmanic idea of sovereignty are also a plenty uh, if we consider, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that we are uh, dealing with a narrative of just 43 stanzas. So uh, I come to uh, my conclusion. Um, the analyzed uh, narrative reflects two central aspects of the greater Magadha hypothesis. The integration of the theory of karma and rebirth into a novel hierarchy of re religious efficacies, including Ved Vedic ritualism and ascetic power as the most effective force. And second, the creation of a new ideal of kingship in which an important task of kings is the expansion of royal power, the fulfillment of ritual obligations and the maintenance of social stratifications into four classes. So, um, uh, yeah, um, it's uh, very, very obvious that for me, uh, the greater Magadha hypothesis uh, opens up new perspective for interpreting uh, the creation of Brahmanism as it is reflected in the Mahabharata. And I think that is uh, clearly uh, a step forward uh, to, to earlier research, as we have seen, for example, uh, in the brief statement uh, by Edgerton, who says that there is no relationship at all between the Buddhist version of the story of Mandata 
and uh, uh, the Mandata Upakhyana in the Mahabharata. And one could also uh, have a look at uh, um, how um, in Viado uh, judged the Jantu Upakhyana. So she said that we pass over in silence chapters 27 to 29, which in their desire to concentrate in this holiest space of India, a maximum of events do not escape inconsistency and thus do not reveal anything essential. And I think uh, that uh, yeah, one can uh, come uh, further in one, uh, one's analysis than uh, to this uh, stage. Yes, uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. And Dominic, you are muted. There we are. I'm just saying thank you. <laughs> I won't, re <laughs> okay, I won't repeat welcome. it. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, uh, yes. So uh, are there any questions? The floor is open. Questions and responses. Uh, Could I uh, jump in? Uh, I, I I think this. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, very interesting talk, and uh, uh, I think uh, it's very persuasive that we can see the Buddhist influence there. Um, but I wonder, uh, is that the same as requiring the full uh, Greater Magadha, uh, the full form of the greater Magadha hypothesis, or is it just a matter of our response to Buddhism that we're seeing here? Uh, I, I don't think that I prove the greater Magadha hypothesis uh, in any way. Uh, and it's not possible to prove by analyzing, yeah. analyzing uh, two uh, brief narratives from the Mahabharata, uh, the greater Magadha hypothesis, or to disprove it in any way. I, I uh, have a, a similar attitude um, towards the Greater Magadha hypothesis like the one that Dominic voiced. I find it very useful. I'm using it in my teaching and I tell it it's an hypothesis. And I, I think that it enriches my perspective on the material that I'm dealing with. And with regard to this uh, narratives that I presented here, I found it very, very useful. Yeah? Uh, so uh, first the integration of uh, a causality of uh, 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 religious efficacy the idea um, that obviously karma theories were not well known uh, to King Somaka and to his priest, you know, because they both were surprised to this when they, when they came to hell. And this only works as a narrative if, uh, if uh, the theory of karma is not presupposed by the audience. So the audience must share this kind of surprise. What is happening? Why is he now in hell? Uh, what is going on? So I think this shows that the theory of karma and rebirth is introduced to a certain uh, society, uh, uh, which is the same that is connected to the crea creation of neo-Brahmanism. In, in, uh, so, but of course you're right. We do not hear about people living in the region of Greater Magadha. Uh, we do not hear about the cities of Greater Magadha. Uh, uh, and it's maybe impossible uh, to uh, demand th this kind of information from a narrative. I would say, that these narratives fit very well to the scenario that uh, Johannes Bronkhorst outlines in his uh, book, Greater Magadha. And I think that is a step forward. And I think this is uh, some, uh, uh, maybe the direction in which we uh, could go. We can, uh, some, yeah, uh, we have to, to uh, provide our evidence um, in support or against the Greater Magadha hypothesis. And then future generations will see uh, which is the, um, uh, yeah, which is uh, the more likely uh, hypothesis. Yeah. So, sorry, I keep being muted. Um, I didn't see whose hand went up. Uh, Johanna, could you go? Could you say? Yes, thank you very much for your talk. I like it very much. And I would like to just uh, just uh, mention some Vedic antecedents of, of, of the story. Uh, for example, the fact that uh, 100 queens in the story of King Jantu, it was as far as I understood the story, I'm not so sure if I really, really understood it, but I understood that 100 kings, uh, queens uh, took take care of one boy 
And this, uh, this idea, this model that there are many females who, uh, who surround one boy and take care over him, it comes from the Rig Veda, it, it is attested at least in the Rig Veda and the model of fire, who, which is surrounded by waters. And in fact, the boy becomes fire because he, he is burned. And then in the Rig Vedic model, uh, the waters are not all, only mothers, but also lovers of fire. And in this story, it's something similar happened that a seaman was somehow uh, emerged from, from, from the fire, from the boy, from their son, we, and they got pregnant. So this, this would be an example uh, how cultural frames coined in the earliest earliest texts are motivate later thinking. They, and another thing which I wanted to, to also, Rig Veda came to my mind is that star, is this moment when Mandha, uh, sorry, Mandhatra was anointed by Indra and subdued uh, all the kingdom as Vishnu had done with his steps. So this is this is in the Rig Veda when Vishnu uh, Vishnu helps uh, Indra and Indra tells him Sakhe Vishnu Vitaram Vikram Aswa and and so on so and th with that is is also connected the fact that royal royal power should be uh, expanded and I think that it also is attested in the in the Vedic text it was discussed by Honda and his ancient ancient Indian concept of kinship and in Hest by Hesterman in his analysis analysis of the Raja Surya, and it is somehow connected with this Vikramana of Vishnu, and that the king, who is Viraj, uh, should uh, also expand his power. So, so this is uh, maybe they, they, the composers wanted to, to, to make uh, them their new Brahmanic thoughts uh, really deeply grounded in the tradition. Thanks. Absolutely. Yes, uh, I agree. And I'm uh, very happy for your uh, supplements. It's, of course, impossible uh, in, the, uh, in this limited time frame to fully analyze and to, to show all the uh, references that we find. It's a very dense text, yes, uh, with, in, with a few uh, um, stanzas, a lot of material is, uh, uh, is combined. And I think that you, um, in the end, uh, su support uh, my interpretation, namely that the, uh, the Mandato Pakyana is meant uh, to promote the Vedic ideal of kingship by drawing and referring to the uh, a different ideal of kingship that we find uh, in uh, the, uh, 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 under the rule of uh, yes, yes. in the region of Veta Magna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, they want to redefi redefine this, these, their exactly. ancient. So exactly, yes, in yeah. new terms and in new yeah, conditions. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Nathan. One second. You hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. I don't know why, but for some reason my uh, Bluetooth uh, headphones don't work well with that anyway um so so thank you philip that was a really great talk i really appreciate it um i had a question about the that slide where you were um uh discussing possible buddhist uh illusions uh in the uh the the story of my daughter um so i, I i'm a little bit dubious about some of them because they i i I, I definitely think that uh reading the mahabharata that we need to be uh looking for references to sort of broader shramanic movements. But I, I, where, I guess where I become a little bit um, uh, unsure is when, when there, there are uh, interpretations to say like, okay, this is spe re referring specifically to Buddhism. Because I, I, my, my own sense is that but both in the Mahabharata and also in like the Dharma Sutras, for example, references to shramanic movements tend to be somewhat oblique and a lot less identity based than we might like from a modern perspective. Um, and so the, the pr particular example I wanted to focus on was the, the issue of Nirvana. Um, I think from a modern perspective, because of the world religions framework uh, and the particular way in which textbooks have been written and so forth, we, we, we get this sense that, that certain terms were owned by specific traditions. And, and so I, I think it can be a little bit dangerous to think that the Buddhists like own the word Nirvana. 
and that that say Hindus own the word moksha, where, whereas in or that that Jains own the word jinna, when in fact a lot of these words were being used by lots of different traditions, and and which is not to say that I that I think that the interpretation is wrong. I don't I don't know. <laughs> I just I'm, I'm a little bit. Um, uh, unsure when I see see the word nirvana, like oh that that must definitely be a reference to Buddhism. Because I, frankly, another way you could read it is just being some sort of like straight idiom. Like, I mean, the word nirvana means to be to be blown out, to be cooled. So it was, he took a drink of water, right? And then he was like, like he cooled off, you know, yeah. and, and he was happy. Um, but which which is not to say that that's right either. I just don't know. But but I, what I wanted to ask you is, you said that there were twenty two references to nirvana in the. Mahabharata, and I'm wondering, like, how is it used in some of those other instances? I, I believe you said most of them were in the Bhagavad Gita, and I and I believe that there, it's used in a very straightforward sense as liberation, in the same way that Buddhists use it, in, in a, but in a positive sense, not mocking it. But but I don't remember. Could you yes, speak about uh, that? Uh, I, I mentioned this uh, briefly uh, in my talk. So. Um, the other 21 references to Nirvana are all referring to um, a soteriological aim in a positive way. So this is the only uh, uh, instance of uh, Nirvana being used for something profane. And uh, in order to uh, interpret the term Nirvana here, you also have to take into consideration that uh, uh, how Buddhists describe Nirvana, namely as the end of thirst, of tanha, yeah. So, and uh, here, uh, the, the king, he uh, quenches his, his very worldly thirst, yes, and then he passes out yeah, into nirvana, and he is extremely happy. So I think these are three references to Buddhism in a single sentence. And, uh, uh, and uh, the word nirvana being used here in a very profane sense is in, in my view, a clear indication that the ideal of Nirvana is uh, devaluated here or used in a, in a certain ironical way uh, at the least. And uh, I think that is, uh, of course, <laughs> I cannot, uh, uh, if you don't share this view and, and think, uh, uh, yeah, that's just a coincidence, but I, I think it's possible uh, to come to this conclusion by on statistical means, you can look at it uh, you don't find uh, nirvana uh, very frequently in the Upanishads, I would say, yeah, at least not in the earlier Upanishads. If you look at uh, um, even later texts, like for example, uh, Patanjali Yoga Shastra, you find uh, Apavaga, Moksha, Kaivalya, very important, also for Sankhya, Kaivalya, yeah, you don't find nirvana there. I think there is a certain kind uh, of uh, identity connected with uh, these terms, which does not mean that they cannot occur uh, and uh, may not even travel um, from, from one religious setting to another. And, and then there may be a development of these terms. But uh, I don't think that the use is arbitrary in any way. Dominic? If yes, you thank you. Yes, um, fumbling with my keyboard. Jason, thank you. Yes, um, I'm not sure. Can you hear me now without the headphones on? Oh, good. Okay. All right. Um, so, yes, uh, th thank you, uh, Philip, very much for showing us the kind of interplay of intertextuality in these uh, stories from the Tirtiatra Parva. Um, I'd like to make a suggestion suggestion and then come back to the broader question uh, that you posed at the beginning of your talk about the use of narratives as historical sources. Um, I was convinced um, by the you know, Buddhist resonance uh, uh, with King, with the story of uh, Mandatri, um, you know, because that is a, uh, uh, I, I think that uh, when we look back at your slide with the table of contents, um, what we also see there is that in the uh, Tirtiatra Parvan, there are also uh, in sequence um, the Shibi story and the Rishi Ashringa story, which have been demonstrated, you know, quite quite clearly to um, uh, reflect this kind of interchange uh, between the Mahabharata and uh, the Buddhist Avadana Jataka uh, literature. And the suggestion I'd like to make. Um, as a way of 
kind of augmenting the greater Magadha hypothesis is to think uh, more broadly in terms of these uh, narratives as uh, connected to places, which is, uh, of course, the broader framework of the Tirtiyatra Parvam. Um, and I, I, I wonder, uh, because I've noticed, at least with the um, uh, last story you mentioned, uh, the um, uh, Mandatri story, that it was uh, associated with uh, uh, Kurukshetra. Um, and then, of course, the Jantu story also is about, you know, going to visit an ashrama, uh, you know, in, in terms of the frame story. With the, uh, it, it's an interesting coincidence, perhaps, that uh, the Shyama and uh, Rishya Shringa Jatakas uh, are localized um, in Buddhist traditions of another greater country, uh, Gandhara, um, at, at particular shrines um, that uh, are associated with, say, mountain passes um, that, uh, you know, would be kind of um, make sense, right, for stories about ascetics uh, in, their, in, in, their, uh, in their retreats. So the way I would like to suggest that the uh, Tirtiyatra Parvan sort of corresponds to the greater Magadha hypothesis is that it, it's kind of, it may be read as an attempt to repurpose uh, sacred geography to claim back uh, these places uh, for uh, particular uh, shrines of, of ashramas, of, you know, rishis or other people um, are, you know, of course, Kurukshetra as well. Um, so that's just a suggestion uh, to think of a more kind of place-based approach to reading this uh, intertextual, these kind of intertextual relationships that we see between the Mahabharata and uh, the Buddhist narrative literature. Um, but I'd like to ask you to maybe expand a little bit on your own thoughts about uh, the role of narratives as historical sources. Because um, you posed that question, I'm just asking you to, to answer it for us. Um, yes. Um, I, I believe uh, it's possible. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, uh, what you said is uh, was uh, very, very pertinent and uh, uh, the, uh, the idea that uh, these stories were maybe recreated in order to uh, reclaim, or maybe not to reclaim, but to claim now for Brahmanism uh, uh, um, sacred uh, space that uh, was uh, um, previously uh, used or also meaningful for uh, the religions of uh, Greater Magadha. I think that that uh, makes sense yeah? um, and is uh, something that one uh, uh, should take into consideration. And I also agree to you very much that there is much more material in the Tirtayatra Pavan uh, of relevance to my topic than that what I could present uh, right now here. I mean, it's clear it's just have a uh, very limited uh, time and uh, Shibi and Rishya Shinga and uh, yeah, I think all these uh, stories uh, in, in some way or other may have more, more um, relevant material also with regard to the role of the Veda and uh, in many other topics. So my, my uh, but uh, coming back to, to, to your question, what I wanted to say um, about uh, the use of narratives as historical sources. Um, I think that in, in some um, streams of postmodernist stories, uh, there was a tendency to um, separate narration from, from history and to um, abstract from the author as the one who created uh, uh, history, uh, the narratives, uh, with the idea that meaning of a history of a, of a narrative is created in the head of the audience. And that it's therefore uh, uh, the intention of the author would not play any role. And I think that this is not true. I think that it is possible to understand what an author wanted to say or to, um, to argue about different interpretations uh, of, of the same story and um, making um, claims that are more or less well supported by the material at which we look or at, uh, by, the, by the surrounding culture and what we know about the sur surrounding culture. So it's not just literature is there and, and we have to stop there. 
and I think a lot of uh, uh, Indological scholarship uses, of course, written sources and literature um, because we don't have uh, much uh, um, other uh, historical records. But of course, it's, uh, it's important to do this cautiously. Yeah? Hopkins, for example, he had analyzed uh, the uh, Jantu Pakyana and said, okay, this is a clear uh, um, proof that uh, human sacrifices were performed in ancient India. It's not the case. Of course, the, the human sacrifice is, uh, is here used in, as a motive uh, for uh, an unethical form of a sacrifice in order to make a point with regard to what happens in the next world. So it's not an attestation of a human sacrifice actually happening. So I would say, yeah, uh, and, and uh, this example serves uh, to, make, to make my point that it's uh, um, important to understand the stories to analyze them carefully in themselves and then to carefully relate them to the cultural environment in which they have been used and uh, uh, created. Does this answer your question? Oh well, yeah, it does. Um, and it also helps me to kind of see how you're applying the greater Magata hypothesis as a kind of heuristic uh, to get at the authorial intention uh, behind the repurposing of these narratives. Mm -hmm. So thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we, we, we're just a couple of minutes over time, but I'd like to, um, I had several points, but maybe I can raise them in the later discussion in the seminar period, but um, in the symposium period. But there's one I just wanted to mention because it's really a tiny footnote to a footnote. There was an unexpected expression, Vikata Jwara, in the uh, moment when the person, when the character dies, and, he, uh, and or, no, no, it's, it's no, uh, when, he, when he prefer, uh, prepares, uh, he's uh, asked to prepare um, himself for the stay in the ashrama. So we will stay here in the ashrama for six nights uh, uh, without uh, we got a Jwara. Uh, without Jwara, yes, we got okay. A so, uh, and what happens next? Uh, Virtually nothing because the story is uh, coming to yeah. the end. Lomasha says we will okay. stay here, uh, then, uh, well composed and without fever, be prepared. So he yeah, advises yeah. Yudhishthira to, to prepare himself for the stay in the ashraman. And I think uh, that uh, this preparation shows that there is something ritualistic going on and yeah. that, uh, that um, probably asceticism is being practiced there in the, right. in the ashram. So then um, uh, I... Uh, so my observation is, uh, I, I was, I, I, it went past a bit quickly, and I was slightly distracted. I thought it was preceding his transition to another world or something, but it, so then it doesn't matter. Um, my observation doesn't apply. Um, well, thank you very much. I thought that was really a fruitful session and a very interesting uh, methodology, Philip, and a very illuminating analysis of these uh, Mahabharata tales. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Professor Vagish Narasingham, who is currently Assistant Professor at the Department of Integ Integrative Biology in the and the Department of Statistics and Data Sciences at the College of Natural Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, I'm very happy that Vagish can uh, join us because I think it won't have escaped any of our notices that completely new methodologies are beginning to press upon Indological studies. Um, the one illustrated yesterday by John Peterson is the application, and, and in your talk, Philip, uh, is the application of uh, natural language processing. Uh, now that we're beginning to have corpuses or corpora of, of uh, Indic language materials, all sorts of analyses um, are beginning to be possible. Um, that throw important light on, on how languages and peoples uh, have changed over the centuries. The other major field that has burst upon us and is beginning to answer and, and throw fresh light on a number of questions about ancient India is, of course, the analysis of ancient DNA. So uh, I was very pleased when Vagish agreed to, um, to talk to us uh, about some of the uh, breakthroughs and new ideas that are coming from the field in which he specializes. Um, 
uh, Vagish has worked with David Reich, who is one of the, the leading names in this field, and uh, recently moved from Harvard to University of Texas. So uh, it's my pleasure, Vagish, to introduce you and to invite you to, to give your presentation. Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Uh, Fine. First of all, thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I have to confess, uh, listening to the, to the talks, I felt like a bit of an outlier scientifically. And, um, but, but I hope that some of the evidence that we're bringing, although it's much, much sparser and um, perhaps hasn't been around for as long and therefore hasn't been examined with the same fine tooth comb, that uh, perhaps the linguistic uh, evidence has, that perhaps it's gonna add something new to the picture about Indian population history and particularly uh, to the subject of the symposium. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vakish. What a fantastic, uh, what a fantastic uh, presentation. A lot of uh, information to uh, absorb and, uh, and to process and a lot, of inf a lot of methodology and science that's quite unfamiliar to a lot of us, I think. Um, so yes, it's open for questions. I mean, this, I mean, I'm sorry, I've got, I've got lots of questions, but anyway, let, let me uh, open it to the floor. So am I directing or uh, Dominic, are you? No, no, I, I'll, I'll pick people, Andrea. Yes, thank you, Vagesh. Uh, it was very clear presentation. It, you certainly feel, I mean, you focus, I take it that you focus on the West, um, on the Indo-European you know, side of the story. I was actually expecting to hear something more about the east, the eastern part, in which I'm interested. Um, I, I know from um, you know, John Peterson that you have been working on this ancestral South Asian uh, ancestry. And uh, I also saw in one slide that you mentioned this, uh, these two small circles for the Southeast Asian hunter-gatherers and agriculturists. And I wonder whether I take it that okay, you are working on this probably you cannot elaborate too much on it, but I wonder whether you have something to say about that other side of the story. Because yesterday, John Peterson, for instance, uh, you know, uh, connected this uh, linguistic uh, substratum uh, uh, or in origin Austroasiatic to a possibly cultural substratus, substratum and also to a, to a um, uh, genetic ancestry. Maybe can you elaborate on that? Oh yeah, so you know I focused on Indo-European, but obviously the population history of India is much more complex. And so I want to talk. I'll, I'll talk specifically about two things. The first is the movement of Iranian farmer ancestry into the south of the subcontinent of India. So we can sample individual groups who have actually no step pastoralist ancestry in India today. So these individuals are found um, in the Nilgiri Hills. And so these are tribal groups in India who largely resemble individuals from the Indus Valley civilization. So they have no step pastoralist ancestry. They only have hunter gatherer and farmer related ancestry. So we can look at these individuals and get an estimate of when farming related ancestry arrives in the deep south of India. So present day Tamil Nadu, say. And so the first line of evidence there is that this occurs very late, so only around 500 BC. So that is that hunter-gatherer groups, so that, so that is the deep south of India is largely populated by groups who are not related to perhaps groups in the Northwest um, of, of India and until only around 500 years ago. So this farming mixture only occurs there very, very late. So the second bit of evidence comes from a particular group called the Juan, um, who are a, a group of individuals who live in the eastern part of India. And um, so these individuals, so if you look at the population groups that we've sampled in, in India today, they largely fit what's called a cline. So um, I'm going to share this screen. Um, so they largely fit what's called a climb. So that is that you, if you look at these ratios, they sort of slope a bit. 
So that is that you have a certain proportion of hunter-gatherer ancestry, you have a certain proportion of farmer ancestry, and a certain proportion of pastoralist-related ancestry. So these sort of slope in a, in, a, in a diagonal fashion, and it's actually very consistent. So if you sample 140 different groups instead of just 20 or eight or whatever the number of showing here, you, you see a very nice pattern of the oranges sort of going down, the greens going down, and the blues going down. However, there are certain groups who have extremely high levels of blue, so much higher than you'd expect based on where they're lying on geographically. And so those groups happen to be Austroasiatic populations. And these Austroasiatic populations actually have very high levels of hunter-gatherer ancestry, so more so than all the other populations. So suggesting that there is additional flow into these populations from the east, where there's additional hunter-gatherer ancestry that's present. And in fact, the closest population that we have genetically that's associated with that hunter-gatherer ancestry are the Ongi populations from the Andaman Islands. So what this is saying is that it appears, and, and, so, and fourth, uh, and so the, the third thing I want to say is that if we take broadly Austroasiatic individuals in India today, there's a fourth proportion of ancestry outside of hunter-gatherers, farmers, and steppe pastoralists that's related to East Asian. And a particular type of East Asian ancestry, which is Southeast Asian ancestry, um, that's related to the people of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. And so this particular ancestry is seen largely in most Asia, Austroasiatic speakers, including Vietnamese individuals and other individuals on the Eastern end of, of that language family, but are also seen in Austroasiatic speakers in the subcontinent. So, you know, the process is complicated and the timing of when that ancestry arrives, uh, what proportions and which populations that particular ancestry mixes into is still unclear, but we're hoping to have ancient DNA sequences from the Gangetic Plain soon that we'll report on that might provide some, some data on that space. Thank you so much. Yes, other hands. So, uh, Vagish, uh, um, I would like to ask you uh, really about something. Well, so, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, this is a caricature, but um, the Indo-Aryan invasion, the Indo-Aryan migration to India suddenly appears to be women carrying, uh, speaking Sanskrit and teaching everybody to drink milk. Is that an absurd <laughs> simplification? Um, so this idea about the female mediation uh, of the first pastoralist incursions into North India, uh, or, or North South Asia. Um, have you, I mean, you know, what does that, what could we make of that sociologically? Right. So I think this is, uh, uh, you know, part of the main problem or sort of difficulty in sort of interpreting this and also on trying to understand the Indo Europeanization of, uh, of India. And so, you know, one hypothesis could be that the Swat or the Gandhara grave culture are sort of an isolate population. That is, that they're somehow isolated. And therefore, that you know, they're getting a particular pulse of Indo-European ancestry or step pastoralist ancestry that's different from everybody else in South Asia. So that's hard to believe for two reasons. So one is that these the Swat proto-historic grave samples uh, or Gandhara grave samples don't appear to be atypical. So they fall within the cline that's established with all the other samples from India. They have more proportions of a step pastoralist ancestry, largely because they're in the northern west point of South Asia, and there's a climb going from north to south, but uh, they don't seem to be atypical. The second thing could be that you know you have groups of individuals, so integration into different groups. So India is a big place; could have occurred in some places male mediated, in some places female mediated. You then have one group of people where there's may perhaps male mediated gene flow and an establishment of a society or a culture or, or a state of some level. This state then begins to take over at least, uh, you know, in terms of sort of um, occupying territories or whatnot, um, different parts of the subcontinent and influences 
the language, the lingua franca of that region. So in one particular group, it could be that the incursion was of much higher frequency, say 50% or 60% overall, and was male mediated, perhaps. And this group of people formed a state. And thereafter, um, what you're reading about in the text, the wars in the Mahabharata and so on, are related to these groups of people moving over and taking over different lands. And the Indo-Europeanization of South Asia, particularly the north of South Asia, is occurring later and is occurring during the time period where all these texts are written about. And that is the process by which large groups of people are Indo-Europeanized. So, and it's not the initial wave that occurs around 2000 BC. It's absolutely fascinating. This, you know, in many ways, plays directly into Johannes's uh, con ideas about how the Brahmins won. Uh, that this that's this exactly, is the... that's exactly right. And so, this other hypothesis about or the data presenting the difference, the, the conditional ancestry of pastoralist to farmer ancestry in Brahmin and Bhumihar groups, in in compared to other groups, which are living right directly by them also sort of plays into the same idea. So, you know, I, I think in some ways, the evidence that I've presented now sort of really moves to in that direction. Um, Thank you. Um, there's something that uh, didn't come up in your presentation, but it it uh, it struck me extremely forcefully from David Reich's book. Um, and I just thought it, it, I don't think it's necessarily relevant to this conversation, but it's just such a striking fact that I, I would quite like to ask you to, to just talk about it very briefly. And this is the idea that there are endogamous groups in India that have been basically not marrying outside their caste groups for 3000 years. It almost, um, it's almost beyond belief. I wonder if well, you could say something about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we can observe population mixture happening. So one, and, and a simple way to do that is to look at what's called identity by descent. So regions of the genome that you share with other individuals. So if, um, and so if you take a group of individuals and say you look at your, your brothers or your sisters, you share 50% of your DNA with them and your cousins 25% and your second cousins 12.5% and so on. So anybody who's a close relative shares large chunks of DNA, uh, you know, 50% of your chromosome, 25% of your chromosome, so on and so forth. So you can look at such sharing that takes place, not just, you, know, you go into say a tech office in India versus a tech office in London and sample hundred individuals and look at how these sort of segments that are shared between individuals break up depending on the groups of people that you have. So if you sample hundred white British individuals in London, whatever that means, um, you'll see that the distribution of such segments is actually broken up into smaller bits and is widely distributed across all of these 100 individuals. If you do the same thing in a tech office in India, you'll see quite the different pattern. You will see five or six, depending on how many groups there are, groups of individuals. Each of them have large chunks that are shared between each other, but very few that are shared across the groups. So suggesting that largely, the sort of mixing between people is happening between endogamous groups, even though they're living inside the same city, say New Delhi or something like that, living right beside each other. But if you look at their genetics, the sharing is only happening within certain groups of people, even within that tech office. So, uh, and you can look at multiple measures which suggest when this sort of process happens. And that is multiple thousands of years in the past. So, you know, and, and you know, statistically, you can look at when these sort of bottlenecks happen, and, and that's at that point of time. And so, intuitively, this is you know how you sort of think about that process. But why it happens, the cultural reasons why it happens, and perhaps you know, outside of modern times, historical times is actually unclear. It's a, it's a, it's a very, it's it leads to directly to a very interesting remark that that uh, David Reich makes, which is that India is not a, you, you look at India and you think this is a giant population of people, but it's really a large collection of small populations. That's exactly right. Well, um, 
uh, honestly, I would love to go on discussing this, but we also have to uh, give time for Lauren. So, Vagish, I want to thank you very, very much indeed. I noticed in my just looking over the recordings from yesterday that clapping on on Zoom just looks stupid. So I won't. <laughs> but anyway, please, please receive the applause of uh, of our symposium members and of all the um, uh, the members of the public who've been able to share your talk. So thank you very, very much indeed. This was a, a real treat and a, a real eye opener for some of the new methods that can actually answer questions empirically that uh, Indologists have been asking for many, many years. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, Lauren has very kindly uh, uh, agreed to um, to allow a five minute break now. So we will we will have a five minute break. We'll reconvene in five minutes. See you then.
So thank you very much and uh, welcome back everybody. And um, I would like to uh, thank Lauren for um, being flexible about the time. It's, it's, uh, I know that it's a bit tense before one gives one's talk, uh, but it's, it's very good of you to have uh, uh, given us this five minute break. I think we, maybe we all needed it. And I would like to in, in, invite Dr. Lauren Bausch of the Dharma Realm Buddhist University to talk to us now on Vedic causality before the Upanishads. Lauren, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic, for organizing this symposium and for inviting me. One of the marks of a great scholar is the amount of discussion that follows the publication of his or her ideas. Johannes Bronkhorst has certainly changed the discourse in our field. I distinctly remember first hearing about Greater Magadha from Jason Schwartz and Elaine Fisher at the 2007 American Academy of Religions conference in San Diego. I bought a copy from Brill at the conference itself. Reading the book inspired my decision to attend graduate school as well as my dissertation topic. I am grateful to Bronkhorst for giving me so much to think about in the last 14 years. Reading Greater Magadha was very exciting, but many of the Vedic sources referenced postdate Gautama Buddha, and for that reason are not the best witness of the Vedic concepts and ideas that would have been circulating during the rise of Buddhism. Granted, Bronkhorst draws from the Shatapatha Brahmana. However, it seems to me that there is more to this story. In this paper, I expand on my dissertation on Kosalan philosophy in the Kanva Shatapatha Brahmana to include other Brahmana texts. I focus mainly on the Agnihotra ritual because one, Gautama Buddha praises this ritual specifically in Pali discourses. And two, this, um, let's see, this ritual forms the basic twice daily practice of all Ahit Agnis. If a system of cause and effect can be discerned in the theory and practice of this fundamental Vedic ritual, then I argue the doctrine of karma has a basis in the Brahmana texts and that it was known to the Buddha. The work of Hank Bodovitz on the Agnihotra has been indispensable to my study. My approach is both philological and philosophical. Religious concepts often point to something beyond the senses, incognizable, inconceivable. Philosophy has the task of re-enlivening philosophical concepts once they cease to point to direct experience outside language. This happens when people get too comfortable with concepts. The concepts circulating for a while, sooner or later, are assumed to be known by the intellectual mind. For this reason, philosophical concepts periodically undergo a makeover in which they take new form in language, but still point to the same experience beyond the words that point in that direction. Looking for exactly matching concepts and phrases across time would only be possible if a given spiritual tradition was dead. The Vedic tradition has thrived for millennia and philosophical concepts have been reinvented many times over. Abstract philosophical ideas in Vedic were expressed by means of tangible objects found in daily life. These same things, however, are given explanatory connections, bandhu, in the Brahmana texts. These explicit connections enable us to see various metaphors at play, which, understood together, impart a coherent system of cause and effect. I believe this causation was known to Gautama Buddha and served as a basis for his teaching of karma. Many scholars restrict heaven to a place one goes after death and merit to what qualifies a person for heaven. But in the Brahmana texts, the yonder world or heaven 
often homologized with the sun, was not a place you go and you die, though that also occurs after the funeral cremation, so much as a repository for the offerings and a symbol of the second body of the sacrificer. That the Agnihotran reached heaven twice a day, every day, should cause us to rethink how heaven is implicated in every moment of life on earth. The more germane question for me is what it means to be alive. This paper investigates the Vedic understanding of cause and effect in the later Samhitas and Brahmanas, which if accepted, suggests that the Upanishadic sages did not borrow the doctrine of karmic retribution from a separate culture of greater Magadha, but restyled its own concepts in a long-standing parampara grounded in Vedic ritual. The paper is divided into three parts. First, I will summarize previous scholarship on the origins of the karma doctrine. Second, I will outline a few philosophical assumptions underlying the worldview of the Brahmana text. Third, I will present a pre-Upanishadic Vedic philosophy of causality and its corresponding ritual practice. So part one is a summary of previous scholarship on karma. Herman Oldenburg devotes a chapter to causality of various sorts in the Brahmana text, covering causality in the sacrifice and magical causality, speech and ritual actions. He does not think these shy beginnings of causality are very developed. Yan Honda discusses how sukrita or merit or positive result of the correct performance of ritual acts accumulates in yonder world. Honda believed that we can only speculate about the origins of karma. Assumptions of a non-Aryan origin remain speculative. Hank Bodovitz traces numerous concepts related to karma and rebirth in Vedic cosmology and ethics. In response to Paul Horsch, who rejects a non-Aryan origin and says that the karma doctrine developed out of Vedic thought, Bodovitz asks, what is meant by Aryan? And how do we account for a process of acculturation? He acknowledges ethical karma in the Brahmana texts, but he finds no reference to rebirth on earth except in some later Brahmanas and no indication that anyone wanted to be freed from karma. Bodovic shares what appears to be the earliest attestation of karma in the classical sense from the Taittiriya Brahmana. So, um, quote, this is the eternal greatness of the Brahman. He does not increase by karma, nor does he become less. His Atman knows the path. Knowing him, the Atman, one is not polluted by evil karma. Bodovitz also provides what he calls the scanty material on non-ritual Vedic karma. He finds that Sukrita and Punya occur regularly in Vedic texts regarding um, reaching heaven demerits obstruct this goal. In Taittiriya Samhita 7.3.11.2, sacrifice produces merit cattle and offspring. Bodovitz admits that this looks like karma. Quote, so at best one may regard the ideas about sukritam, meritorious activity and the resulting merit stored in heaven as predecessors of the doctrine of karma. However, he connects the classical doctrine of karma with the so-called shramana tradition because ritual karma does not account for negative karma. He concludes, I believe that the complex of karma, rebirth, and moksha did not originate from the mainstream of Vedic religion, the ritual, though elements are discernible in late Vedic texts, end quote. According to Wendy Doniger, the pinda offering to the ancestors is a primary form of karma might it not be the primary karmic transaction? She examines the Shraddha offering in, in the Grihya Sutras, noting that the Pinda denotes an embryo or seed. Herman Toll shows how many passages in the Upanishads have antecedents in the Brahmanas. Either the inability or unwillingness to recognize the ritual substratum of the Brahmanas resulted in misunderstanding the origin of the karma doctrine and the imposition of ethics. Tull asserts, quote, 
The notion that one becomes good by good action, bad by bad action, appears to be a reflex of the Brahmanic idea of the merit resulting from the well done sukrita sacrifice and its opposite, the demerit resulting from the poorly done dushkrita sacrifice that awaits the sacrificer in the next world, end quote. Bodovitz points out that bad actions do not belong to the sphere of Vedic ritual and that Honda did not equate dushkrita with bad ritual. Given that demerit has broader implications, Bodovitz argues that merit too does not exclusively refer to ritual performance. Basing his work on the Shatapatha Brahmana, Toll connects one becomes good by good action, bad by bad action with the doctrine of the cosmic man. He sees the Upanishadic karma doctrine prefigured in the Brahmanas, especially the idea of Saloka, having a world together with um, one or another of the constituents that represent the various planes, loka, of the Vedic cosmos. Through ritual activity, the sacrificer recreates the primordial sacrifice from Rig Veda 1090 to become one with the cosmos. In particular, Tull argues that the sacrificer, himself a mere man, Purusha, becomes Prajapati through performing the Agni Chayana he returns to his original state of wholeness. While the dismemberment of Prajapati enables manifest existence, it also initiates cause and effect. Ritual, set, ritual acts set into motion a series of causes that eventually result in the sacrificer realizing his whole and immortal self. While I agree with Toll's theory, duly acknowledging Bodovitz's correction, I also accept Honda's caution that not enough evidence survives to know for certain. In addition to the silent non-extent textual sources tra tracing back to the so-called culture of greater Magadha, we also have lost numerous Vedic texts, some remnants of which survive in Gosha's collection of the fragments of lost Brahmanas. In my opinion, however, um, our available textual sources suggest that the doctrine of karma originated in Vedic tradition. Part two, philosophical assumptions in the Brahmana texts. So Vedic cosmologies explain how everything created emerged from the same source. A key technical term is praja, a creature, offspring, progeny, or anything generated, who is thus by extension that source itself, but with an important difference. Whereas Prajapati and Brahman are whole, man experiences himself relative to everything else, thanks to Agni. Agni Vaishvanara is homologized with the Brahman making the offering. Agni is both death and the procreator. In um, Kanva Shatapatha Brahmana 3.1.10.1-4, Prajapati emitted Praja, including Agni, who decided to burn the other Praja. The other creatures tried to extinguish and crush Agni, um, who entered man, Purusha, with the agreement that as man maintains Agni in this world, so Agni will maintain him in yonder world. Since Agni's lifespan is undecaying, Ajara, and undying, Amrita, so the Agni Hotran becomes undecaying and undying. Agni forms an integral part of the human being. Prajapati is often said to be the only one who existed in the beginning, but he's, he is also the mind, as it were. In the Shatapatha Brahmana, Prajapati wished to be born, so he practiced asceticism to generate Agni, but Prajapati was afraid of Agni, um, thinking, I generated this consumer of food, but verily there is no other food here besides myself. Atman. At that time, the earth existed in Prajapati's mind, Manas, and making an offering in himself, the plants, the sun, and wind arose to protect him from Agni, death. The one who knows thus protects himself from Agni, death, who will eat him. So according to this story, Prajapati is born as a hungry Agni, but Prajapati himself constituted all the food. As a consumer of food, which consisted of Prajapati, who is the mind, 
Agni seems to stand for the intelligence aspect of Prajapati's mind that eats things. I believe that this eating secondarily expresses cognizing objects dualistically. Afraid of being eaten, Prajapati offers an ablation in himself. Through offering, Prajapati generated the plants, sun, and wind, implying that all three lokas were created. Whereas the body feeds on plants, the mind feeds on the sun, a metaphor for the unmanifest. Agni, death, is constantly feeding on these worlds in order to live. By setting up a regular system of offering between the worlds, Prajapati ensured a continuation of life for his Praja. In other Brahmanas, the light, Prajapati's eye, and the sun are offered to overcome death. While Prajapati usually personifies the absolute and Brahminical cosmologies, Brahman in the neuter frequently stands for the original ground of being. In the Shatapatha Brahmana, Brahman alone existed in the beginning, but like Prajapati, it desired to procreate. Practicing asceticism, Brahman admitted itself from itself, the devatas, and placed them in their respective worlds. Agni was sent to earth, the wind to intermediate space, and the sun to the sky. After creating the worlds, Brahman wanted to come down to experience relative existence. But first he had to figure out how to make the worlds continuous. He made the worlds continuous through, through two Brahmins called name and form, Nama, Rupa, which are glossed as speech and mind respectively. Thanks to obtaining name and form, the devas won non-dying, Amritatva, and the same world as Brahman. The sacrificer who attains these two Brahmins reaches a complete life in this world, inexhaustible non-dying in yonder world, and the same worldliness as the devas and Brahman. This episode reveals that the relative, that, sorry, start over. This episode reveals that relative existence was considered something positive to be enjoyed by the absolute. But some mechanism was needed to make the newly separated worlds continuous. Taking the place of the ritual offering in the previous cosmology, name and form become the mechanism by which the worlds go on without languishing. Nama and Rupa are homologized with mind and speech, as are the two Agnihotra libations. Given that the devas are dependent on offerings from this world, the relative existence of human beings who employ mind and speech and intellectual functions more than guarantees a constant supply of offerings to the devas. And with these offerings, the devas give offerings in return, which secures a continuity of the worlds. This cosmology, which employs abstract categories, provides an important bridge to earlier cosmologies. But the point is basically the same. Name and form replace Agni and Praja as the new currency for exchange between heaven and earth. Name and form indicate that the relative embodiment of Brahman had a definite mental and linguistic aspect because of which the continuity of existence was possible. The sacrificer who is ultimately identical with Prajapati as the absolute and with Agni as a creature can be an Atmayajan offering in his own body or self, or a Devayajan. Jaimaniya Brahman at 1.2 declares that the Agnihotran places the oblation in his own body in these immortal breaths and makes for himself an immortal body here. According to Jaimaniya Brahman at 1.17, offering in the divine womb, i.e. the Ahavaniya fire, he emits his self which arises in yonder sun. The Shatapatha Brahman agrees that the offering becomes his body in yonder world by which he is delivered from death. The Kamba recension specifies that the body, Atman, of the consecrated Yajamana consists of libations and merit in yonder world. Merit here is Sukrita. Bodhavitz observes, nowhere, however, is it stated that one receives back what is offered, end quote. I hope to show, however, 
that receiving offerings in return is implied when the sun enters the fire um, every evening in the Agnihotra and when the praja are harnessed from the sun in prana. The two bodies of the or Atman of the Yajamana map onto lokas. According to Honda, loka sometimes means a world, position, or situation, but sometimes it lacks a definite location. Honda goes on to posit that lokaha in the plural may denote the various states of existence in this world and that beyond, i.e. in the realm of samsara, in contradistinction to the state of those who do not return to the human condition. The lokas may overlap. It is possible to participate in more than one of them. Loka is also the place occupied by Nama Rupa. In this way, the world inhabited by the Yajamana or the situation he found himself in was something he could influence as a result of ritual action. I think I'm sure to slide, okay. According to the Shatapatha Brahmana, the yonder world, um, Asau Lokaha, is a space of light that is shut off by darkness. But by dispelling the darkness by light, one reaches the heavenly world. Sayana defines Svar as a common name for the bright sky and the sun. This sphere of light and well being is not necessarily localized in a definite place. Um, Svarga, meaning going to the light, or as a Bahuvrihi, sharing in the world of heaven, refers to both this life and to the hereafter, and was not, or not always, identical to the realm of the dead. Reaching the Svarga Loka resulted in a firm foundation, or Pratishta. One did not want to reside in Svarga so much as to be firmly established in both worlds, because then he was safe. Honda describes pratishta as a stability in the face of impending dangers from unstable and trans transitory mundane conditions. Because each performance of the Agnihotra potentially wins a foundation or residence in heaven, Honda said the right, quote, may be said to promote the rising a new rising of a loka, end quote. In the Brahmana texts, the Yajamana makes this world, meaning the earth. Honda suggests that Amritasya loke be taken in the sense of in the realm of life, a sphere or realm in which the person concerned may enjoy the unimpeded continuation of his earthly existence. Alternatively, there are passages that speak to experiencing immortality in the Svarga Loka. But my point here is to show that knowingly making a world implies knowledge of a causal relationship between one's actions and its consequence. Panchavinta Brahmana 6816 describes this continuity by saying, this world is born again and again. I am loka punaha punaha prajayate. The sacrificer was particularly keen to make good lokas, like the sukritam loka. According to Bodhavit, sukrita denotes that which has been done well and the merit, which is mostly but not exclusively obtained by organizing a sacrifice. It is an investment. The Taitariya Brahmana explains that this world of merit is punyam karma. The Taitariya Brahm Brahmana, ex oh, I just said that, or per bodhavits, it is obtained by doing karma. He says, and the world of merit is the womb of the bearer. He says, Agni verily is the bearer. The world of merit is meritorious karma. Agni alone is the one who bears those merits. He puts in the meritorious karma, the world of merit. I make a pleasant situation for me along with my wife. The successful sacrificer becomes Punya Loka, one whose world is Punya or obtained by Punya. For example, um, Sparga Lokaha Punya Loko Bhavati and um, 
Therefore, they say he who has sacrificed is one whose world is merit. So this too suggests a karmic result. The main means for winning all the worlds and Swarga in particular is ritual offering. Though one can also win a good loka by releasing a cow um, and can secure punyaha lokaha on earth by receiving a Brahmin in one's house. The loka one is described as luminous and meritorious. The sacrificer is often said to see or touch Svarga loka. The text further describe one reaching, ascending, securing, discerning, prajna is the root, approaching, turning oneself to, etc. Svarga. Knowingly being in contact with or gaining the lokas transforms them into a safe situation without threat of harm. From a position of safety, man wanted to live a hundred years on earth while at the same time knowing his true nature as the impersonal primal being. While the Yajamana goes to Svarga Loka, he returns to and is firmly established to this world. Going to heaven and coming back down to earth is compared to climbing a tree. Kaushitiki Brahmana 7.9 advises that one should dwell in the vicinity of Svarga Loka, while Aitareya Brahmana 7.10 submits that in this world is yonder world of heaven. Because the Brahmana texts speak so often of acting while knowing, the traditional division between the Karmakanda and the Jnanakanda does not seem totally apt. This knowing is not a fact that one intellectually apprehends, but a direct seeing or knowing of cosmic processes. As Bodhavitz already observed, the expression ya evam veda, or evam vidvan evam vid, is fairly current in the Brahmanas. And Tite observes, we always find in the Brahmana text the growing importance of knowledge. The mere action cannot produce the expected or promised result. Knowing is connected with light, in particular the light of yonder world. Not knowing was expressed as darkness. And there is of course a grave consequence to knowing or not as indicated in the Shatapatha Brahmana. Quote, and they who so know this or they who do this karma come to life again when they have died and coming to life, they come to immortal life. But they who do not know this or do not do this karma, they come to life again when they die and they become the food of him, death time after time. So this, I think, explicitly articulates a cause and effect relationship. Um, this knowing and conquering of the three lokas through ritual offering leads to completeness. The sacrificer seeks a complete life, a complete sacrifice, and to become sarvam. According to Honda, in the Brahmana text, idam sarvam denotes the completeness of all and the escape from death. Knowing the yonder world, the sacrificer is whole and complete, like Prajapati before creation. Okay, part three, Vedic causality before the Upanishads. The root yaj denotes offering or honoring and includes all types of action performed in a sacrifice, such as bringing fuel for the fire or running a race, as well as any type of offering including but not limited to throwing something in the fire. The yajamana or the one offering, i.e. the sacrificer, is formed from the present participle, participle of the root yaj. The sacrificer of Shrauta ritual had to be an ahit agni, meaning he undergoes the agni adhana, whereby he kindles the sacred fires and maintains them throughout his life. The agni adhana initiates a lifelong atma yajna, in which the ritual fires are homologized with the yajamanas pranaha. Um, life breaths, but at the same time, devaha, divine powers or the senses. So in Kanvashatta Pata Brahmana 1, 2, 2, 10, it says, um, quote, where they churn that fire, they breathe on that fire. 
which was generated. Breath, prana, verily is agni. It generates that which was generated. Then he breathes out. He kindles that fire within himself. So Bodhavis clarifies that the internal pranaha, which are homologized with the fires, receive oblations. In the Agni Adhana, various elements of the kindling map onto the mind, sight, hearing, prana, and speech. Dividing these five into three, he keeps offering to these internal devas. In this way, the Atman of the sacrificer is the object of the right and the original vihara of the fires. After the sacrificer is reborn at the Agni Adhana, he generates himself. Jaimini Brahmana 1.2 states, quote, the oblation is the Brahman self. This he places in his own body, Atman, in these immortal life breaths, the fires. He makes an immortal body, Sharira, for himself here, i.e. in the Agni Adhana and Agni Hotra ritual. According to Yuravitz, um, quote, then the composer of the Jaimaniya Brahmana states that the oblation is the sacrificer's svar, the sun, the light of the sun in the sky. The reason for this identification can be found in Vedic cultural convictions and metonymic thinking. According to the Vedic composers, uh, the oblations go to the sun. The sun is seen as the container for oblations and the metonymy content for container oblation for the sun justifies this identification." End quote. Acknowledging that Bodovitz reads svam instead of svar, Yuravitz says, quote, the oblation cooked on the Garhapatya fire is conceived as part of the sacrificer that should be given to the fire. Poured into the Ahavaniya fire, the oblation develops into his immortal self, end quote. Both readings, point to the Brahman having not just a physical body, but also an immortal one, analogous to the luminous yonder swar made of oblations offered here. The sacrificer's material body or Atman is the abode of the life breaths, while his undying body is in the form of um, an oblation, mind, breath, sight, hearing, speech, rich, yaju, salmon, brahman, and gold. Uh, similarly, in the Kanvashatapata Brahmana, the yajamana forms in the verb is samskaroti, his own atman, which the sun tells him is his body, atman, made of libations and made of merit, ahuti mayaha, sukrita maya atma. In both texts, the new body made through sacrifice leads to non-dying and reaching the goal of Svarga Loka. No ritual was more fundamental to the construction of the Yajamana's body and Loka than the Agnihotra, the small but mighty Shrauta ritual performed twice a day every day of the Ahit Agni's life. According to Tite, carrying out all of the prescribed actions of the Agnihotra, including um, Oh, including the full recitation of the accompanying mantras would require four to six hours to complete. Since the Agnihotran performs this offering both in the morning and evening, completing the simple Shrauta rite is a full-time job. And yet, without performing the Agnihotra twice a day every day, the Ahit Agni is not eligible to be the patron of any more elaborate Shrauta ritual. For this reason, the Agnihotra would have been the most important and widely practiced Shrauta ritual. The Agnihotra was understood to be unlimited, the reduced form of more complicated rituals. Its non-performance was to end only in death or old age. The Shatapatha Brahmana identifying the Yajamana with Prana says as long as he breathes, he performs the offering. But when his breaths are cut off, so too is the Agnihotra.
So as a consequence of Prajapati's first Agnihotra offering, day and night emerged as separate, revolving, alternating entities referred to as two repeated deaths, punar mrityu, or the arms of death. This suggests that the post-creation offering itself initiates constant change in the world, hunger and death. This um, prajapati even tells humans that their praja are their death. To subdue Agni, who is death, and constant punar mrityu, liquid oblations are offered. In this way, the Agni Hotra is food to ward off repeated death. Ironically, sustaining the life of Prajapati's creatures involves constant dying. An offering must be made incessantly so as to feed the relative existence of them. The alternation of day and night represents this constant change through the metaphorical domain of the sun cycle. The Agni Hotra releases one from repeated death. Vedic texts focus on defeating Punar Mrityu. Through the ritual, one places all the worlds, the devas, etc., inside himself and conquers repeated death. But what makes day and night dangerous? Kaushitiki Brahmana 2.9 calls day and night the flood that takes all and the missile of the God that goes on its way eager to kill. Similarly, Jaimini Brahmana 1.5 speaks of day and night as two impassable oceans that come and withdraw in a revolving alternating way. Both Brahmanas suggest that twilight serves as a ford or bridge whereby one way cross. Here, day and night may be understood as lokas, which are destructive insofar as they destroy one's merit. Um, once born, man dies constantly with the revolving of day and night. In the Rig Veda, the sun is depicted as a single wheel in which day and night follow each other. Similarly, the Aitareya Brahmana describes day and night as wheels. According to the Shatapatha Brahmana, Day and night, which are on this side of the sun, exhaust the merit, sukrita, of a man, just as driving in a chariot, he looks down at the two wheels rotating, so he looks down at day and night rotating. Then day and night do not exhaust his merit, sukrita. He who knows it in this way wins what is inexhaustible. The rotation of day and night burns through the merit earned by making ritual offerings, which are needed to make the locus continuous. But by directly seeing this rotation, the merit is no longer exhausted. Looking down, and the root is prati ava ich, requires a perspective from above, which is why the sacrificer must go to the svarga loka at least twice a day by means of the agnihotra. The sun is said to be either identical with Svar or located in the Svargaloka. Like Agni, the sun is death, Mrityu, and the abode of the sacrificer's Praja, which constitute part of his own body. Jaimini Brahmana 111 states that whatever is beyond the sun is immortality, but whatever is on this side of the sun, day and night carry this away from here, as a whirlwind may carry away. According to the Shatapatha Brahmana, quote, the one that heats is indeed death. Therefore, those praja being on this side are mortal, and those on the far side are immortal. These praja are harnessed to the vital breaths by rays of light, just as a horse would be harnessed by a rain. This one verily setting enters Agni alone. Since the sacrificer forms his own body in yonder world, the praja he generates through ritual offering are himself. So every time the praja are harnessed to the vital breaths, to his prana, the sacrificer in the form of his praja experiences death again in yonder world. The Madhyandana version adds that whomever the sun causes to die if that one 
has not escaped death, he dies again and again in yonder world. By offering the Agnihotra, one is released from Punar Murityo. So when the Shatapata Brahmana says that day and night rotating exhausts the Sukrita of a man, is this merit the same as the praja, harnessed in the breath? I suggest that Punar Murityu is the harnessing of the sacrificer's praja, his merit in the breath, to be consumed by his senses in the physical body, his atman. His own creatures, generated through previous offerings, comprise the food that nourishes and sustains his conditioned life. I argue that this cycle constitutes a Vedic system of cause and effect, explaining not only how the worlds are made continuous, but also how that continuity of relative life requires the repeated death of, of Praja in yonder world. The Agnihotra is also the ship by which one crosses over day and night, constant Punar Mrityu in addition to gaining the perspective for seeing the rotation or exchange between this and yonder world, during the Agnihotra, the Yajamana sits between the Garhapatya and Ahavaniya fires, which stand for this and yonder world in the Aitareya and Shatapata Brahmanas. Sitting between the fires destroys his evil. Evil passes over him and he becomes one by whom evil has been destroyed. Between the fires come lokas, he can see the exchange between them. Um, so this quote from Shatapata Brahmana, then, he, then that he sits in between is because this Agnihotra is verily the boat conducive to Svar. The revolving of the sun is a wheel of cause and effect in which yonder world forms a container for those causes that will be born in the sacrificer's senses. Sitting between the fires, his gateway to Svargaloka, he reaches and is firmly established in the Svargaloka. Knowing in this way, his merit becomes inexhaustible and he wins what is inexhaustible. Directly seeing the sun and reaching this world of heaven was an integral part of every Agnihotra performance. In the Kaushitaki Brahmana, one reaches the Svargaloka at twilight. Oops. Oh, I'm not sure. Okay, when it reaches the Targaloga twilight, and by touching the coals with his ladle, he places a sacrificer in heaven. In the Gopatha Brahmana, by the first libation, the sacrificer places himself in heaven, and by looking back at the Garhapatya fire, he keeps in contact with this world. In um, Shatapata Brahmana, Madhyamdana, 2536-7, looking back toward the Garhapatya joins this in yonder world, whereas the second libation um, places a sacrificer in heaven. Aitareya Brahmana describes the sacrificer being placed in heaven like an elephant taking him up with his trunk. Similarly, Jaimaniya Brahmana 111 depicts going to heaven like a man on an elephant seat being lifted up. In this way, the sun takes the yajamana to yonder world. There are lots of other examples. I won't give you all of them. So the principal offering, milk, is homologized with the sun. It is cooked, but not overboiled, on the Garhapatya fire, which stands for this world. The two libations, which represent what is future and not manifest, i.e. the praja, and what is past and manifest, i.e. the atman, um, are poured in the ahavaniya fire, where they become part of the sacrificer's body in yonder world. The libations are further homologized with mind and speech, um, which an above cosmology used to gloss nama and rupa. In this context too, prana is called the rope by which mind and speech have been harnessed to the heart, following the way the cow and calf are tied to the post for milking during the ritual. This suggests that the praja are related to mind and speech as both are harnessed to vital breaths. 
According to Titte, the sacrifice in the Brahmanas would appear nothing short of a result producing machine. He sees sacrifice as a generative process where the seed is also called continuity. The Agnihotra is described in the metaphorical domain of birth, which plays a key role in the workings of Vedic causality. The two offerings in the morning and evening create an ongoing cycle in which Surya is offered into Agni in the evening and Agni into Surya in the morning. Agni inseminates in the evening and Surya procreates the embryo in the morning. Jaimini Brahmana 111 also describes how the sun enters its yoni, the fire, when it sets. Bodhavitz translates yoni here as layer or receptacle, reasoning that he does not see procreation in this context. I, however, understand yoni as womb here. In Jaimini Brahmana 1.8, the offering passes the night in the condition of an embryo before being born through the morning offering. Similarly, the Shatapata states, Surya verily is the Agnihotra, going to set he, the sun, having become an embryo, Garba, enters the very fire, the womb, Yoni. Following the one who becomes an embryo, all these praja become an embryo, for they lie down as if requested, being unaware. Then the night just conceals that, for an embryo is hidden, as it were. End quote. The setting sun enters the fire as an embryo, the womb. This, in the same way, all the praja stored in the sun become an embryo, lying unaware, hidden. With this passage, we get more details about the cause and effect relationship playing out between this and yonder world, represented by Agni and Surya. The sun entering the fire in the evening represents part of the sacrificer self from yonder world, his praja, entering Agni, his physical body, represented by the Garhapatya fire and breaths. Night conceals the embryo, which is incubating and unconscious as a kind of latent potential waiting to be born. This night, as we know from the rotation of day and night, represents part of the cycle of the sun, which if unseen exhausts the sacrificer's merit. I suggest that this passage describes a process in which previous offerings, which can be conceived as creatures produced through the perception of duality and which are stored in the sun, form the basis for experience. Having given rise to new experience, they again become an embryo. The hidden embryo of the sun gives birth to new praja, to new cognition. When the sun enters the fire, if the sacrificer does not see the embryonic offering from yonder world, that praja dies through being used up in cognition. The yajamana must see the praja in embryonic form when it just enters his earthly womb and offer it back to yonder world after it has passed through the fire. Then the light of Svar is revealed. If the praja take birth in his body, the light of Svar is blocked and the praja are used up in the dualistic perception by the faculties. Like a womb, yonder world is said to be concealed by darkness. After dispelling the darkness, one steps over to the Svarga Loka. This process of the sun entering the fire and fire entering the sun is causal and forms the basis of the Vedic karma doctrine. In middle and late Vedic, evil is associated with death, night, darkness, and ignorance. A bad destination, say for a thief, is darkness or a world of evil, Papaloka. The Agnihotra Brahmanas emphasize the root of evil, which is darkness or ignorance, and how to be released from it through knowing. A popular simile found in this context is of the snake casting off his skin, found in the Shatapatha and Jaimaniya Brahmanas. In the Kanva Shatapatha, quote, as a snake would cast off his skin, so having cast off all evil, which is the night, he, the sun, rises, 
just as a snake would cast off his skin. So he who knows this in this way casts off all evil. Following that son who is being born, all these praja are generated, for they are admitted according to their objects. Yatha or yatharpa. When growing, a snake molts because his body has increased and the old skin is too small. Similarly, the action of casting off the night enables the sun to come forth in an expansive way, having cast off ignorance, which like the skin acts as a cover so as to restrict the light and scope of yonder world. The text further unpacks the simile, saying that the action of the sun being born should be extended to all praja, who are generated according to their objects, specifying that praja who are located in the sun as the sacrificers past libations and merit are generated according to the respective sense objects, strongly suggests that the metaphor be seen in light of perception. When Yaevam Veda casts off ignorance, the sun or light of Svar is born free from evil and more expansive. The Jaimini Brahmana confirms that one keeps ridding himself of evil deeds day by day who offers the Agnihotra knowing thus. Jaimini Brahmana 1.9 to 10 connects both Agnihotras with deliverance from evil maintaining that whoever knowing thus offers the Agnihotra is freed from um, any stain or evil. Removing the cover of ignorance increases the Yajamana scope and lets the light of the sun shine unobstructed. Um, one then knows through direct experience his true nature as a primordial being. If he doesn't know his true nature, then when he departs from this world, he is scorched or dragged away, day and night take possession of his world, and he does not overcome Punar Mrityu. But knowing his true identity as Prajapati, as his offerings in the sun, the sacrificer is said to go to the sun, obtain the Atman in the sun, get Salokata or coexistence in the same world as the sun, or he enters the sun and the essence of his merits. According to the Maitrayani Sampita, he becomes a star. In conclusion, mechanisms for cause and effect that ensured the continuation of human life and allowed for going beyond were articulated in Vedic. We have seen evidence for the belief in making a loka which had good and bad future consequences, and the general notion that actions lead to results in the form of a loka, the situation in which one exists. The exchange of offerings between the two bodies of the yajamana, between the two worlds, in the form of the rotation of day and night, or as the evening and morning agnihotras, express a Vedic model of causality. The metaphorical domain of birth allows the Brahmana text to convey both who a human being, both who human beings ultimately are and how their infinite light becomes enveloped by darkness. Daily ritual practice trained the Agnihotran to directly see how his own creatures, Praja, enter the womb that is his Garhapatya fire, his Pranaha, and ultimately the senses where they are either born as cognitions, if he remains ignorant, or purified through his own fire and offered back to the sun through the womb that is the Ahavaniya fire, if he offers knowing in this way. In the context of making a world in which the verb samskaroti occurs and a ritual practice, which especially for the Yajurvedans pertained mainly to manual actions or karma, I see strong evidence for a Vedic origin of karmic retribution and no need to import ideas that were already present in Vedic tradition from the culture of greater Magadha. Thank you. 
Thank you very much indeed, Doran. That's very interesting, uh, deep and, and uh, difficult material that you've explored here so successfully. Thank you very much. Can I open this up to questions and to observations? Yes, yes, Johanna. Um, sorry, sorry. There we are. Yeah. Good. Thank Good. you very much, Lorena. Lorraine, I am very happy to hear your paper, and and it was very interesting. And I am also happy to 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 see that that um, not on that your many of your conclusions are similar to my conclusions, which I which I have presented in my books and papers. But I would like to ask you about a more specific a specific problem, because I, I'm a little bit lost uh, with Praja. I mean, um, uh, do you, uh, is it uh, how do you understand it? Maybe it's uh, that I somehow lost during the during listen. I was lost during listening to you, but I am a little bit I have problem how to fit Praja in this whole model, if you could, uh, which is which is uh, um, ex, uh, described in the exegesis of Agnihotra. So, so if you could just explain it to me. There, um, throughout the Agnihotra Brahmanas, you see this derivatives of the root um, Prajan repeated. Um, so Praja is very often repeated, of course, the action of creating the creatures, like what Prajapati wants to kind of procreate himself, they use mm -hmm. the root prajan. You also mm -hmm. wanted to create this creative power, they create a nominal form um, out of it. Um, I don't remember exactly what that was, but mm -hmm. this kind of creation, it's a kind of birth mm -hmm. thing. So but you will, you, sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. go on. I see it more like in the sense of anything that is being generated through mm -hmm. this kind of offering process. Mm -hmm. So, so you would see this creation of this immortal self, or immortal part of the sacrificer, who, thanks to which he will survive the killing death of the sun, uh, that it is conceived in terms of generation. I mean, of generating a, an embryo, and then this, 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 the, as if we could say the um, the first form of this immortal self is the embryo in the Ahavaniya or Garhapatya, how it was. Yeah, their creative potentials, the way I mm -hmm. see them. And some of the passages actually distinguish, right, the praja that are on this side of the sun from the praja that are on the far side mm -hmm. of the sun. So mm -hmm. I think the ones that are on our side are the ones um, that undergo the punar mrityu as a mm -hmm. result of not having direct knowledge of them. So mm -hmm. those undergo this kind of cycle of birth and death constantly. Mm -hmm. But if you have knowledge, then your praja gets stored on the far side of the sun as the beyond. And that is more in the realm of the immortal kind of uh, mm. body sacrificer's life. I mean, it's always potentially immortal, I feel like, but if you don't have the knowledge, you don't get the benefits. Yes, of That's course. Yes, yes. yes. So, knowledge and karma is important. It's necessary yeah. both. Yes, yes. I wanted to ask you about something else, but I forgot now. So maybe- We, we, can, we, can, we yes. can come back. Yes, Johannes. Yes. Yes, thank you very much, Lauren, for this uh, detailed analysis of um, Brahmana passages. And I will not even try to discuss um, the details you have presented. I will ask a question which probably will sound very simplistic to me, to you, um, and that is the following. The issue at stake is the origin of belief in rebirth and karmic retribution. So one could proceed as follows. Identify the first passage that mentions this explicitly and if possible, clearly. Not hinting or so, but that's a matter of interpretation, I suppose. Usually people said these earliest passages occur in some Upanishads. Maybe you think there are other texts that have already clear indications as to this particular belief. So I will not start quarreling about that. 
the, but I like to recall what I said in my introductory lecture that all notions about chronology have to be re-established. There is nothing self-evident about the priority of one kind of text to another. So once you have identified a text or texts that you think very clearly give expression to this belief, your next task is to show that these texts are older than the beginnings of Buddhism and Jainism. You have not touched upon this issue, but I think it's crucial. As I said, perhaps I don't know if I skipped that in my introductory presentation, there is no fallback position. You may not like the greater Magala theory, you may reject it, but what, there is nothing to fall back onto. The uh, ancient idea that the Upanishads are pre-Buddhist and all that, if you believe that, fine, but you have to argue for it. And I have not seen any strong arguments, but maybe you will be the first to present strong arguments. As long as you don't do so, you talk a little bit into an empty hole. I mean, you find passages. Well, precursors is one thing, but I like to know the first passage that says, that enunces this doctrine clearly, and if possible, explicitly, and then we raise the issue, how do they relate to the beginnings of Buddhism and Jainism? Now, if one were to come to the conclusion that these earliest passages in the Veda that clearly pronounce this are later than the beginnings of Buddhism and Jainism, is there any need then to look for the origin of this doctrine in the Veda? Because we know already that it was around in other circles. That's one remark. I'd like to add a second one. Namely, um, and I refer back to Vagish's lecture um, just an hour ago. Genetically, it appears that Brahmins really have a rather separate position in the Indian population. Um, and as Dominique afterwards recalled a remark by David Reich, India or South Asia is not one big country but, or, or population, but it is lots and lots of small populations. Now, and one of these small populations is the Brahmins or perhaps dividing, doesn't matter. These people, they, they had these obscure reflections, which are difficult to interpret, which you seem to be doing very well, but that was something internal to a small group. Why think that anyone outside that group would even be interested? When we read in the Buddhist texts how the Buddha meets Brahmins, they never talk about the things you talked about. They only talk about that they Brahmins are better than everyone else. Never this kind of philosophical talk. So again, that for me raises the question, all the things that we find and we can interpret in the Vedic tradition, why should anyone at that time even be the slightest bit interested in it? And of course, what you maybe you seem to be going much further by saying, no, they were not only interested, they accepted this belief, they made it general, and it became so important that people gave up their life and became aesthetics just because of some consequences of that. Here I see some gaps, but maybe you have ideas about that. Thank you very much. I really am happy to hear kind of your reflections on some of my thoughts. I've wondered for a long time. Um, first, let me start out with the point about looking for kind of some clear expression or articulation of um, the points. Uh, I think I could say, you know, Bodovitz fell into the same category. He was looking for the complex, he calls it, of karma rebirth and moksha. Um, like you wanted some kind of uh, statement, you know, from the Brahmana text, like, oh, yes, we have this belief. Um, but I think that sometimes blinds us to seeing how the texts work in their own right. I mean, the texts, as I tried to state very clearly, the Vedic texts, they're not using language in this kind of abstract logical way. The texts are using kind of very tangible objects to express their abstract ideas. 
And this to, I think, many early um, scholars appeared to be very simplistic, appeared to be kind of empty of any meaning. But I think if you just look at Joanna's work, you'll see very clearly that there's so much more going on in these texts if we just read them up, you know, according to how they work. And my approach is philosophical. And I, I could only present limited material here, but um, might interest some people here that my book project on the Vedic causality, no, Vedic philosophy of language and causality will take up earlier Vedic material in terms of philosophy and look at how um, philosophy of language and causation are dealt with across Vedic. I don't deal with the Upanishads. I just, you know, so a little bit of the Rig Veda mostly in the Sankhitas and Brahmanas. Um, because this period needs to be understood better. And I think Joanna has done a lot of work on this, Honda and um, Bodovitz, Tite, but there's so much more. These texts are voluminous. They're huge and there's so much in there. So I think we're just scratching the surface to try to figure out what that they've said. And I'm not gonna go back and try to date all of these other texts, it's beyond me. Just trying to understand, I have two fields, you know, Vedic texts and then early Buddhist stuff. And that's, more than I can handle. I, I can't do more than that. So I leave that to other people to try to, you know, historically situate these things. You're right, it needs to be done. I just, I cannot do it. I don't have that in me. Um, but my interest is more in the kind of the development of these ideas and how they can be traced and the different expressions that we see um, in the text themselves from their own perspective and lens. Um, so I know that's not very satisfying to your question, but I think that's all I can do at this point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Uh, Nathan. Can you hear me this time? Great, great. I think I fixed the problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, Lauren. That was a really great uh, talk. I really appreciate um, the way in which you take seriously the discourse that's found in the Vedas going all the way back into the Brahmanas uh, and also the way uh, Joanna does in her work. So I really appreciate that. I think that taking that that discourse seriously is really imperative for understanding the, the unfolding of uh, Indian traditions. Um, I wanted to ask you, Lauren, specifically about uh, there were some passages that you, you talked about, Nama Rupa, and that was really interesting to me. And actually, Joanna might be able to answer this too, because I think she's done some work on this, but, but that immediately rings bells for me because it's part of the 12 links of dependent origination, right? Uh, so it's a very important concept in Buddhism, and, and you're showing that it seems to be a, a fairly old concept in the Vedic tradition too. And I think you said, Lauren, did you say that it, it represents mind and speech because or that's how it's glossed by some text that really surprised me and anyway I, I just was wondering if you could say more about that why mind and speech and not mind and body which is the what i think of it as and do you see any possible and, and you want to can chime in too uh any possible links to buddhism independent origination thank you for your question nathan and i just want to say yeah joanna's work is really been inspiring for mine. I think when I was in graduate school too, I, I you know, she gave me a copy of her book about um, fire and cognition and the rig data and just this whole metaphorical approach really opened a lot of vistas for me. Um, and so, yeah, I think we, we do see things um, eye to eye in a lot of these questions. Um, but um, Nama Rupa, it does have some early occurrences in the Brahmanas. Um, so that one in the Shatapatha that I referenced is my favorite because it's a cosmology. And this is a means by which, you know, conditioned existence gets to go on and on. There's also a similar reference in the Taitiriya Brahmana. It's not as um, detailed, but it, there is a line about Nama Rupa in conjunction with Brahman as the creator, Brahman in the neuter, of course. Um, and so that is very interesting. Um, and then, you know, of course there are later references in the Upanishads, but that's a different territory. Um, so yeah, they, basically the explanation in the Shatapatha is form is something that you see in your mind. So whatever you see, like basically that's like what exists as form. Um, I don't know if that's very satisfying, but that's what they say. And then the, of course, speech and Nama, that's an easy identification to make. But the Rupa in mind is, it is interesting. <laughs> Was there another part of your question? I think I forgot. Uh, well, sort of like, how does, how does that link to Buddhism then? Like, how do you get from that to 
the Buddhist Namarupa. Oh, there are so many connections. Um, sure. uh, you know, we're talking about a conditioned world, right? In, in, in Buddhism, don't they talk about like how the world is actually the five senses? And so you have all of these elements that link. Um, I think that we get, of course, a re another re-enlivening of philosophical concepts within Buddhism, but a lot of them connect with some of these early Vedic ideas. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly, exactly what the, what Shakyamuni was thinking when he <laughs> took up those terms. Was it just a coincidence? They just happen to be convenient or it's it more of a te <clears throat> technical term circulating in, of course, this region of um, Greater Magadha. Unless it's the other way around and we we need to do what what Philip uh, was doing this morning in reading the reading the Mahabharata and finding responses to Buddhist ideas uh, or, or re recycling and using maybe that's what we're seeing in the Shatabhata Brahmana if it's actually later than the Buddha that would make a very different kind of reading. Definitely. <laughs> but I mean, well, uh, Joanna, sorry, I, I meant I. I wanted to invite you to speak but my microphone was off please, please. no that's that's fine i would like to add just a little bit about more general so so uh, these vedic early vedic texts are really uh, difficult because they they on the when they are taken literally they they may not they make no sense and but uh, our well scholarship develops and and we have new methodologies like cognitive linguistic methodology which helps to understand such difficult texts and with some uh, with some how to say it probability <laughs> so so this is uh, this is one thing and i think that it is very important to as as, as the, it was during the previ previous lecture to to use other methodologies in indology and all so other methodologies of humanities but one more thing i don't know what to do with with those uh, little communities which which uh, maybe we might think that they were completely uh, isolated from each other but i i i have uh, i don't know when i read pali the pali canon I see so many Vedic ideas and so many, and moreover, and now I am translating the Dhammapada into Polish. And when I, whenever I don't understand something in, in a, a word in the meaning of the, how to say it, I feel somehow uh, uh, uncomfortable with meaning uh, in Pali. When I see uh, it's Sanskrit, uh, it's Sanskrit, uh, sorry, I am a bit <laughs> tired or whatever, how, how it looks like in Sanskrit, then some, because I think that the, for me, it seems to me that there were some general models which were shared by those communities, somehow very, very basic models. Of course, not all of them. For example, this model of eating and of eater and food uh, was mainly Brahminic model, but, for, but some other were somehow shared because um, I would say that it is for me, it is much easier to understand as I think the meaning of a Pali where a concept within the con context of Pali text, when I somehow hear the sound of the, those, um, those axioms, how to say it, uh, where, which were uh, postulate, postulated created in the Veda, in the Rig Veda even. I, now I cannot bring you any example from the Dhammapada, but I have such, I can, I can uh, one day I can show it. So, so um, this is what I would like to say. And of course, I don't know much about chronology, but somehow, uh, is it really, because we have this, uh, we accepted chronology that the Vedas, uh, uh, for Vedas and the Brahmanas, Aramiyakas, early Upanishads are somehow, <laughs> located before before the Buddha time but um, is it really challenged now is it because I don't know anything about it is it challenged uh, is other new uh, new proofs which show that, that for example Shatapatha Brahmana is later than Pali Canon so this is for me something well I, I've never heard about something like this 
Thank you. Um, uh, we, I'd like to make some space for the uh, questions that have come up on Slido that um, uh, our PhD student, uh, Jane Allred, will be sharing with us. But first of all, can we have Philip and then Johannes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Lauren, for your um, detailed presentation of really difficult material. Uh, I, I was wondering mm, whether we um, are not facing kind of uh, a semantic problem uh, with regard to, uh, to the meaning of the word karma. I think it's very obvious that in the Vedic tradition we have uh, the word karma, we have a ritual causality, uh, we also have ideas about uh, ethics. Um, we have ideas about uh, puna mrityu um, and uh, overcoming of death. All these uh, things are there, and I think uh, nobody ever actually. Um, oh, oh no, I I I, I, <laughs> I keep this. Uh, I skip this. So th this is there. That's clear. And on the other side, we have a, a completely um, different conception of karma agency in early Jainism, uh, which um, referred to uh, acting in general and avoiding any kind of activity in order to um, overcome a cycle of rebirth uh, and suffering. And then we have a other kind of uh, karma theory in Buddhism, which has to do something with intention. Um, uh, and uh, the two of these uh, theories, this in karma, uh, in, in Jainism and Buddhism, come from from a certain geographical uh, area. And then we have a something like a fully fleshed classical karma theories, like we find it in Buddhist philosophy, in yoga, for example, or in, in Sankhya, in Nyaya. And if one compares uh, which um, karma theory these classical formulations are more similar to. So that coming from Greater Magadha or the uh, causations that we find in the Veda, I would say that uh, the similarity is much, um, uh, much greater to the uh, karma theories that we uh, see in the uh, having developed in the region of Greater Magadha. And for me, this leads to the conclusion that we have an adaptation uh, from there uh, into what we uh, see as uh, yeah, Hinduism or neo Brahmanism. How would you uh, uh, respond to, to this? Um, thank you very much for your comment. Um, I think we have to look at Vedic tradition as a continuous, very long standing tradition and see how the ideas develop from the very beginning onwards. And um, there's more work to be done to see like within, you know, the Vedic literature, what kinds of expressions of causation that we have um, and how that, that works. Um, I see from what I've studied so far that there are many different mechanisms to try to express this idea that, you know, there are um, cause and effect relationships to um, what a human being does. And I see that it's being extended to kind of um, perception, like human kind of the way that we use our minds. Um, um, so I, I don't know what more, what more people want before that they're willing to give Vedic tradition their own space to articulate in their own way um, a belief in karmic retribution. Um, may, may I, is that, uh, have you finished? Yes, uh, Johannes. Yes, um, first perhaps a response to, um, in continuation of what Philip says, the word karma in uh, Apte's dictionary has 15 numbered um, meanings. And I feel like Philip that insisting that the Vedic karma and the post-Vedic karma have to be basically the same, seems to me, uh, well, a little bit doubtful. But, and then I have a remark, a, smith, a little observation to Joanna. Sorry, Joanna. You said, when do we, where do we hear about different chronologies? I would recommend you to read my book. 100 pages about it in it are about chronology in great detail. Mm. I would look at that. 
Yes. <laughs> That's yes. all I want to say. <laughs> there was one but one uh, pas passage that um, I've, uh, I mean, an awful lot of text went past in Lauren's paper, um, but there was one passage where it says, karmana uh, lipyate. And I, I thought, oh, you know, there's an interesting model of karman there. Um, I haven't got anything to say about it, but it suggests to me, it made me immediately think of early Jain models of karman as a material substance that can contaminate you. Yeah, it's an interesting passage. Before reading Borovitz's book, I thought that that first the idea first occurs in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, but it's already in the Taittiriya Brahmana. Um, so it seems to have spread, I mean, mm. within Vedic circles quite widely. Mm. Um, Jane, um, I wonder if you've got some questions. I'm afraid I haven't looked at Slideo at all, so we're completely in your hands. If you can bring some of the queries yeah. and responses from the public. So yes. it's unfortunate that we don't have Professor Nara Singh on here because there's yeah. the majority are for him. <laughs> but so we have one of our top voted ones for Philip is um, from Alexander Uskokov, and they say, um, is thirst not a Vedic marker of embodiment? Um, thirst meaning pipasa. And uh, they say that in Chandogya 8, there's a mention of pipasa that is a marker of the non-liberate itself. Uh, I, yeah, thank you for this question. I did not want to maintain that uh, thirst doesn't play any role within the Vedic context. I just wanted to draw attention um, to the fact that we have uh, a huge number of references to Buddhism, uh, especially to Nirvana. And Nirvana is described in Buddhist sources frequently as uh, a stilling a thirst. Uh, and uh, uh, Trishna, Tanha in, in Pali is one of the, uh, the causes uh, for, uh, for, for rebirth, for remaining within samsara. And th that's uh, simply what I wanted uh, to, uh, to say. Um, it's uh, clear that one can look at these passages from different angles, but I think uh, the I think high proportion of references to uh, Buddhist material in this uh, gives, an, uh, at least to me, a quite uh, convincing overall impression. You know, one can look at this and this and this and then start, start uh, to, to discuss uh, the details. I was suggesting uh, uh, this, um, yeah, and everybody has to see whether it finds it uh, convincing. Yeah? Um, I, I, did, I did not want to say that uh, there are, uh, are no occurrences of uh, relevant passages and references to, to thirst uh, uh, also in uh, Upanishadic passages. But uh, thirst uh, is very, very central for Buddhist uh, uh, sociology and for Buddhism uh, in general. Yeah. Okay, well, I hope that responded to it. Yeah. It sounded like it. Um, uh, so I think Jane, you just got Jane, a new one. That's can I been, can yeah. I just ask, um, Philip and Johannes have their yellow hands up? Is that just uh, left over, or have they got something more to say? Well, actually, I like to say one thing more if I can. Yeah, sure. And it's a bit about this conference at all. I know that some people are not convinced by my arguments, but the least they should do is then show an alternative. I mean, this is totally fundamental to me, there is no fallback position. If you think this whole book is rubbish, you still have, and you take an other position, you have to bring arguments for that other position. There is no certainty that remains once you have re, uh, rejected this. I, I think perhaps some of the participants don't see that so clearly, that if they, for example, fall back on the traditional position, they cannot do so without bringing in arguments. Um, that's all. That's what I wanted to make as clear as I can. Thank you. And Thank now you. you can remove my hand. Uh, well, we actually ha have a have new question that's sort of on this topic, so we can think about it. It's from uh, Adish, and they say, um, and this is specific, specifically um, 
Oh, uh, well, for Lauren, they just say great talk. Appreciate the approach. For the group, they say, um, must we think of karma theory as an intellectual property of group X or group Y? Or could it be a scale of forms? A scale? Sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm not quite sure what they mean there. Maybe if they can say in the chat or something. <laughs> Is this a question to me? Or, or it's for the group, so anyone can say oh, for that. The group. Okay. Adish yeah. just chipped in that it's Collingwood scale of forms. So yeah, I don't think or I think none of us thinks about karma theories as the intellectual property of any group. This is not what we are interested in. I think we are interested in reconstructing uh, the early history of, uh, of South Asia, the early religious history of South Asia and uh, the creation of uh, Neo-Brahmanism or early uh, Hinduism as a, uh, the result of uh, various uh, uh, events that uh, we uh, may, uh, may be able to reconstruct. Uh, so we are we're just uh, discussing different options. So it has nothing to do with intellectual uh, property. We're not saying, so karma belongs to the Buddhists, karma is Vedic uh, uh, exclusively, or uh, yeah, that, that's not, uh, not the, the frame of our discussion. Another, another question, Jane, from... Uh... Yeah, well, does anyone else on the panel want to chip in on that? Because it was for the group. Yeah. Nathan, do you have any thoughts on this? This seems kind of up, up your alley. He's, he may not be, he's gone blank, so he may not actually oh, be at his microphone. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously we see that it's being used across many diverse groups. So that it's true. It's not anyone's intellectual property. I think what was my concern in the paper was to address the point um, in Greater Magadha that the Upanishadic sages borrowed these ideas from the outside. And so I was interested in looking, and I have been interested in looking at, well, did they? Or do Vedic you know, thinkers express these ideas on their own and in their own terms? And what does that look like? Um, but it's a good point, Adish. Yes, Johanna. Well, well, I am just I just want to say that uh, I will try to bring maybe some arguments tomorrow, but I really didn't want to be uh, rude or whatever. So I'm very sorry if you felt like this, Johannes, but this is maybe because of my English or because of my way of expression. But really, I'm sorry if you felt somehow offended or whatever. It was not my 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 aim or uh, whatever. Art. <laughs> so that's all. Um, Johannes, is your hand in the air again? Or Yes, and now I'm listening to Johanna. I forget what I wanted to say. Uh -huh. Sorry. <laughs> well, okay, so maybe you can remember as we go to this next question. Um, so an anonymous questioner asks Professor Moss, wouldn't ascetic efforts be counted as part of karma. Um, for example, um, in the Kamavi Bhanga Sutta of the MN, um, I think this is in reference to the bit about how um, ascetic practices maybe can be outside this process. Um. Yes, I think that, that was uh, the conclusion at which I arrived, no? that uh, a fuller picture in uh, uh, early uh, Hinduism or Neo-Brahmanism includes a large variety of religious practices that may determine uh, the fate of human beings. And uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, th this is uh, the result of uh, an integration of different uh, religious ideas. And we see in Buddhism and from the uh, legend uh, of the uh, life of the Buddha that asceticism um, 
as he uh, is uh, uh, said to have practiced, although we, in the end we do not know uh, much about the Buddha as, historical, uh, as an historical figure, but uh, that this uh, approach uh, did not has not led him to uh, anything. So uh, within uh, Buddhism, asceticism is not a way to overcome uh, karmic uh, retribution or uh, uh, nothing that could lead anybody to spiritual liberation to nirvana. So yeah, I hope that this uh, answers the question. <laughs> yes, Johannes. I remember what I wanted to say. And I wanted to respond to a remark by Lauren about she wants to uh, see how these uh, Vedic ideas uh, figure in context. And I think, of course, we have to appreciate that. And, and I think you do good work. But perhaps you remember that in my introductory lecture, I talked about Hume. And um, because Hume, the, David Hume, the philosopher, of course, has to be studied in his cultural context. And um, people have done so, and that's where he has his place. That does not exclude that in some new idea which I introduced, namely, there is no self, he was influenced, in this case, according to this particular theory, by Buddhism that theory is right or wrong to be judged on its own merit, but you cannot exclude it because you say he has to fit in his, his historical context only and, and the regional context. The same I feel about such Vedic passages. They, they did not stop thinking as they did before and say, oh, we drop it all now and now we take rebirth and karmic retribution. Quite the contrary, we see how it is well embedded, sometimes in great detail, which makes us believe that they themselves had come to that through this historical process. Um, well, that does not exclude that they actually took an idea from outside because at some point it pops up for the first time. You have not identified which passage, passage does so for the first time, but there must be one. And there, this new idea, well, either has developed inside the Vedic tradition or it has been, it has been borrowed from outside. And you cannot exclude one because you can uh, come up with a plausible sequence of ideas that preceded them in the Veda, like in the case of Hume. So you can do, your work, and that will be quite interesting and valuable, but it does not exclude the uh, potential claim that the, uh, the doctrine, the view, was borrowed from outside. And for that, there are other arguments, chronological and so on, which we all know from my book. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Johanna, yes. Well, uh, well, uh, okay. I, I was just thinking that if we agree that uh, some Buddhist ideas influenced Vedic uh, culture, Vedic philosophy, so this shows that there were some connections, be connections between these uh, little commun communities, and it is possible that uh, influence was was in both sides, in both directions. Yes, I, can I respond? Mm, yes. And, and I would not say, and I never say that in, in my book, it's not Buddhist influence, but influence of the culture of greater Magadha, mm -hmm. which well, gave rise to Buddhism, which gave rise to Jainism, but to the extent we know was kind of preceded it. And there was, of course, mutual influence because Brahmanism didn't disappear it went on and has been quite successful until today. The, the whole subsequent history of Hinduism is, as I see it, at, at least incorporates how two important um, currents joined up, influenced each other, modified each truth, and so on. Yeah. So yes, you're right. 
And uh, if I can just refer back to one of the metaphors that, or one of the similes that uh, Vagish used about, um, you know, uh, a call center where you've got a hundred people sitting. And he said, if you look at the genetic history of the Indian group, the South Asian group, you'll, you know, they're all, they're all sort of five, five separate groups uh, genetically, uh, but they're all in the same room and they're all talking. <laughs> mm. I mean, at, underneath a lot of this question, I mean, Adish, I see, put a question actually for Vagish. I, I agree, it's a pity Vagish isn't here, but you know, there is a there is this underlying question that is, you know, still hovers over all of this discussion about the genetics, which is, you know, and and has done, you know, ever since Max Muller, which is the, the extent to which, you know, we're talking about physical populations of people moving, or are we talking about the spread of language use, or are we talking about the spread of cultural practice and uh, the distinctions between these things are not always as, as clearly articulated as we could wish in the data. Uh, Jane, any other questions? Yeah, so we have one for Lauren from an anonymous questioner. Um, how do we pause it um, or maybe explain a unified or consistent concept of karma and they want to emphasize they're not talking about Karman um, across the heterogeneous um, Vedic material and heterogeneous they're specifying across time and space. Okay, that's a big, that's a big undertaking. I don't know how to do that either. <laughs> um, I think we, I mean, I am gonna start, I'm attempting to start a process, but I don't even think like in my lifetime, I'd be able to go through all of the different instances of karma, expressions of karma in the Veda. Um, it's a huge corpus. I mean, really huge. Um, so I think what I can offer, like maybe throughout the rest of my academic career is to find some of them and to try to talk about you know, how that they connect to each other and to some of these um, ideas outside of, you know, the Vedic corpus. Um, wow, thank you very much for this question. It's, it's very difficult. Um, it can be even difficult looking at one text. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm working just, yeah, middle and late Vedic just to try to get a handle on that material. And then I think it'll take other scholars to look more like, you know, at later Vedic material and then what came out of that <laughs> because they have many different philosophical schools and they use different language, have different ideas. Yeah. Anyone else wanna to try to answer that? <laughs> this is tough. Nobody's jumping in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Philip, I wonder, I mean, our time is up, and so I don't want to go on for a long time, but um, I just wanted to raise the, just in response to your, your talk, the um, example of Valmiki, um, who, you know, in one of the, in one of the accounts of, uh, of his, of his um, story, uh, he is in his early history, a robber, and he is, is stealing from people, and he's a sort of, uh, you know, a highway robber, and he's stealing in order to feed his family. And then he, at one point, uh, he asks his family, are you going to share your, are you going to share, you know, when, when I die, when we all die and go to the next world, will you share the sin that I have accumulated? And his wife says, no, absolutely not. And the, so I think there's also uh, maybe another example there to explore. I don't think it makes the points quite as well as your examples, but it's another very prominent example of this, this uh, debate about who actually has to pay for their sins. Whose, whose karma is it? Yes. Um, um, th there are um, say, examples of transfer of karmic retribution in later literature, but uh, that was not uh, common what, uh, uh, in, for early Buddhism and also not for Jainism. And, uh, uh, I don't see it uh, here in the passage that I have looked at in the Mahabharata. So, um, yeah. But what we can see in the Mahabharata are multiple causalities uh, uh, in action. And uh, I think that's, that's also quite 
characteristic for what we see in, in, uh, in, in, in later developments. Uh, the, the idea that uh, pilgrimages uh, can overrule your karma, that you can go to, uh, to Benares, Varanasi, uh, plunge into uh, holy waters to, to wash off, off your, your negative karmas. And these are ideas that uh, we, we see later in a, in a, um, a religious environment where, where multiple causalities are, uh, causalities are accepted. But uh, I think that is a later development. Yes, yes. Yeah, there's a big um, anthropological literature on merit transference in uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism and elsewhere. Yes. Well, what a great, what a great uh, morning or evening. <laughs> what a great series of talks. Uh, honestly, today has been so stimulating and interesting. Thank you all very much to the contributors, to the questioners, to the public who asked really, really probing questions. Um, wonderful day. Thank you very much indeed, everybody, especially Philip, um, Lauren and Vagish. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'll finish today's session and see you again tomorrow. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.